Elections. A House Government Reform and Oversight Subcommittee Friday heard testimony about proposed changes in the way the federal government will classify individuals according to race in the 2000 census. Witnesses include census officials and representatives of civil rights groups. Congressman Stephen Horn of California chairs the three and a half hour hearing. The subcommittee on management, a quorum being present, will come to order. We'll begin with uh, opening statements. This is the third in a series of hearings on how the federal government measures race and ethnicity. Today's hearing follows a major decision on this issue. After four years of review, a task force set up by the Office of Management and Budget, known as the Interagency Committee, has issued a detailed recommendation for changes to the standard measures of race and ethnicity. This is not a casual manner. It is highly personal for millions of Americans who take pride in their full heritage. It also is a vital issue for the enforcement of the civil rights laws of our nation. The current measures include four basic categories of race, black, white, Asian, or Pacific Islander, and American Indian or Alaska Native. These categories and other standards for the collection and reporting of data on race and ethnicity are set forth in OMB Directive 15. A major issue is whether these categories are adequate to measure our society now and in the coming decades. In particular, there is growing concern that asking individuals to identify with only one of these four categories on the census questionnaire and other forms fails to accommodate people of multiple racial heritages. It is not hard to understand this problem. All you have to do is imagine your Tiger Woods, perhaps without the Nike endorsement, and someone is telling you to identify with only one part of your heritage. The challenge is to allow for multiracial identification without harming the usefulness and accuracy of the data. One proposal for multiracial identification is to create a fifth racial category called multiracial. Another proposal is to keep the current four categories, but allow respondents to check off more than one. On July 9th, the Interagency Committee recommended against a multiracial category, but in favor of allowing people to identify with more than one of the existing categories to reflect their diverse backgrounds. In its recommendation to the Office of Management and Budget, the Interagency Committee stated that the multiracial population is growing and needs to be measured, but that a separate multiracial category is not the best way to do this. The recommendation notes that years of surveys and public town meetings showed no general consensus on the definition of multiracial and that such a category is likely to be misunderstood by individuals responding to questions concerning race. As Edmund Burke once observed, all government indeed, every human benefit and enjoyment, every virtue and every prudent act is founded on compromise and barter. The Interagency Committee did just that. In effect, the task force has advised the director of the Office of Management and Budget to preserve the current usefulness of racial and ethnic data and also to acknowledge the desire of individuals to identify their heritage. Some will say this recommendation tries to please all sides and therefore pleases none. There are two distinct aspects to this issue. The first is individual identification. People need to be treated with dignity, especially when they're being asked to identify themselves. The second aspect is the utilization of these data. They are put to some very important purposes, purposes that many would say outweigh concerns over individual identification. The Interagency Committee recommendation leaves the questions about tabulation and reporting of the data largely unanswered. That is a problem, and we need to address it. Will people who check two racial categories be counted twice, significantly inflating the numbers of two particular races in a particular area? We begin today with very distinguished witnesses, and the speaker will be delayed because he's in some negotiations now on uh, major issues before the closing of this uh, next week's session, and uh, we have told him he will be able to speak any time he walks through the door. And so we're pleased when he joins us. 
and we also will be hearing from other members of Congress, and then we will take a number of individuals who are experts in this area, as well as the administration witnesses who will appear after we have heard all the rest of the discussion, so that they can integrate the views of the interagency committee with what they've heard. We will then hear the reaction of various witnesses, and we will finally get the testimony not only of the Office of Management and Budget, but the Bureau of the Census and the Department of Justice. We thank you for joining us, and now I will call on the ranking Democrat, Ms. Maloney of New York, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As you know, I am committed to assuring that the next census is the most fair and most accurate that has ever been conducted. The measurement of race is central to that effort. Unfortunately, all of my colleagues are not committed to this effort. In fact, there are those who would have us pay a higher price for a 2000 census that is less accurate and in some instances will render the race question moot by not even counting them. The 2000 census will be the 22nd census conducted by this nation. Many are surprised that three years before the census, there is so much discussion about what data to collect and how to collect it. That's really no surprise. At this point prior to the 1990 census, the Commerce Department was already in court over how much that census would be, how much that census would cost and, and, and uh, how that census would be conducted. The measurement of race is essential to our understanding of the accuracy of the census. Shortly after the 1940 count, the Census Bureau started looking at the accuracy of the census using birth and death records. In preparation for World War II, the Census Bureau provided the Army with an estimate of the, the number of men eligible for active duty. It turned out that those estimates were low. 13% more black males turned up than the Census Bureau had predicted. It was then that they began to understand the relationship between race and a gross undercount. Now, more than 50 years later, we have quite a collection of data regarding census errors. The methods used in the 1990 census caused nearly 26 million errors. That's an error rate of more than 10%. The 1990 census missed people, double counted people, created fictitious people, Nearly six million people turned up in the wrong place, and these errors were made by using the same methods that are being touted by those opposed to sampling. The results of those errors, millions of dollars in federal aid designed to provide assistance to the poor is being misdirected. Millions of people are, are not being included in apportioning uh, representation our first understanding of the undercount in the census was that young black males were missed at a much higher rate than others. But we now know more. We know that people in rural areas are almost as likely to be, to be missed as those in urban eras, areas. We know that African Americans are missed at a much higher rate than whites. In 1990, the undercount for African Americans was almost 10 times that of non-Hispanic whites. 52% of those who are undercounted are children. I, I believe uh, issues of counting minorities need to be resolved before we decide how they will be categorized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you. I now yield to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Davis, for an opening statement. Sure, thank you. I'm going to be brief, but I appreciate you holding this hearing today. I represent a district that is 25% minority. Uh, very multi-ethnic, and uh, <clears throat> one of the kids I was talking to the other day asked uh, what they're from. He said, well, I'm an American. He said, 25 percent Vietnamese, 25 uh, percent African American, 100 uh, percent American. And that was the way they defined themselves. And I'm not sure that the categories we've dealt with uh, over the past few decades uh, encompass all that Americans believe themselves to be. So I approach these hearings with an open mind, but uh, appreciate the opportunity to hear a number of different viewpoints as we move through this today. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman. I now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for convening this hearing. 
regarding the very important issue of how the federal government should measure race and ethnicity for the Census 2000. I would also like to acknowledge and thank our distinguished panels of witnesses for taking the time to come and share with us their expertise and feelings as it relates to the issues of race, ethnicity, and the census. We gather here today to discuss the recommendations of the Interagency Committee for the review of the racial and ethnic standards on changes to OMB's Directive 15. This is an issue of critical importance to our nation. This issue is directly tied to the accuracy of counting for the Census 2000. When I think about the Census and its importance, I am reminded of a quote from Thomas Jefferson referring to the question of slavery when he likened it to a fire bell in the night that filled him with terror. I submit that the issue of race as it relates to the census is one of the fire bell issues of the day because race divides us, defines us, and in many ways strengthens us. We stand today at a crossroad. We can go forward or we can go backwards. And I say let's go forward. We have measured race in this country since 1790 during the first census. We counted free white male property owners as a whole person and black slaves as three-fifths of a person. And now we're being told that we should be counted as multiracial persons. While blacks are now recognized as 100% of a person, we have not fully realized full participation in the systems of this nation. We have not reached the day where equal opportunity and equal justice prevails. Discrimination is alive and well in America today. We're not a colorblind society. Income inequality between blacks, Latinos, Asian Americans, Native Americans, and whites continue to persist. In education, race differences persist in high school completion rates, college enrollment, and graduate degrees granted. Blacks and other minorities are not receiving a fair share of federal, state, or local procurement opportunities. The question of how we measure race in the Census 2000 has some profound consequences. Census data is used to reapportion Congress, state legislatures, city councils, county boards, and other special political subdivisions. In addition, census data is used to enforce the Voting Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act, and the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. Millions of dollars of federal resources are determined on the basis of the census. I have a great sensitivity towards American citizens who have a mixed ancestry, whether it be interracial, biracial, or multiracial. In fact, I am certain that a large number of Americans could be considered technically multiracial, and especially within certain minority groups. But I do believe that a multiracial category and other major changes could dilute the political, economic, and social progress that minority groups have worked so hard to attain. Such a category could take us back a number of years. However, I look forward to hearing our witnesses, and I do believe that after all is said and done, we will realize that although possibilities exist, I do believe that the American people will take a course of action that will not take us back away from the gains that have been made by large minority groups in this country. I thank you very much and look forward to the testimony of our witnesses. Now yield to the gentlewoman from the District of Columbia, Eleanor Holmes Norton, for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to sit in with the subcommittee this morning. I'm a member of the full committee, but not the subcommittee, and I'm here because I believe this is an important subject and hope we will uh, all be able to come to uh, some rational uh, response. The census itself for, 
for a long time now has been a very controversial and complicated subject. Into this controversy, we now plunge race. The one thing we did not have to worry about in the last census was how we categorize people. We have made a very complicated and very important subject much more complicated. Um, the last, at the last hearing, uh, Mr. Chairman, where I was privileged also to sit, it was not then clear whether the census was going to move us to a new category, a multiracial category. It, 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 they have come to their senses and understood, it seems to me, the rank confusion that such a category would impose upon the, sub, the, 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 the census. Uh, now they come apparently with um, a set of categories that may pose some of the same difficulties. I've come this morning particularly to hear uh, <coughs> about the new proposal to allow people to check multiple boxes. All I can say is watch out. Uh, I can't imagine what kind of confusion may come from multiple boxes. I, I, I know this much. Those who come forward wishing uh, a category to recognize their mixed uh, parentage uh, are very sincere and it, it, it is, I, I, I very much sympathize with what they are doing. Uh, they, they come forward seeking a real solution to their dilemma. I, my problem is I do not believe that solution is found in an official document of the United States. Um, as to several categories, indeed even as to the multi-category, I hope we do not now bring down upon us fun and games in the census as people try to identify themselves in multiple ways and, and in ludicrous ways. We've got to not only ask ourselves what are we after, but how will uh, Americans receive this question? And I can imagine how Generation X, for example, <laughs> would have received the multi-ethnic question or the multi-racial question, not to mention check off how many uh, boxes you feel like checking off. You know, this is serious business. There is much at stake here. I, will, I very much look forward to hearing how OMB uh, describes uh, the discipline in its uh, multiple boxes because that's what I, I'm, in, I'm, I'm interested in. I'm also interested in finding a way for people of mixed heritage or at least mixed parentage if they desire uh, to uh, indicate that mixed parentage. I don't believe we want to uh, intrude on these categories that we've learned to live with. Finally, Mr. Chairman, let me say this. We are not, when we talk about a multiracial category in this country, only talking about a category. We are talking about not a new category, but a new race. And if you do not believe that is the case, I invite you to look at the history of the West Indies, of Brazil and of South America, where indeed there have long been a multiracial category. That is not a category. What attaches to that category have been, have been a whole set of distinctions, privileges, benefits, and lack of same. Uh, the last thing we need in this country, given the role race has played, is a new category that develops in it into a new race. I, I ask uh, that we understand that we are not dealing with this uh, in a, a, a unrelated to history, either of our country or of the world, and that we not plunge into new racial directions in an official way without understanding all the implications. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I now yield to the gentleman from New York, uh, Major Owens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The designation of a racial and ethnic category is not just a statistical uh, abstract government procedure. In America, racial designations are very political, and they were made that way by the majority population a long time ago. Uh, there was a time when the designation octoroon, quadroon, were not enough. Uh, they would not be accepted. 
it was decreed that if you had one black, one, one drop of black blood, one drop of Negro blood, uh, you were automatically a, a Negro. Uh, you were automatically considered descendant of African slaves. And I think that the, there are many constructive reasons why the designation still should continue, uh, not for the same negative political reasons given, uh, provided before, but for very positive reasons. We don't want to lose the identity of the descendants of African slaves. You know, we have a situation now where the president has called for a dialogue to move America forward and to own up to the problem of a multiracial society. At the heart of that dialogue has to be a discussion of what happened with the African slaves. And you cannot talk about justice unless you talk about what happens to the descendants of those African slaves. For 232 years, we had a group of people who were forced to give their labor to the building of this country for, for free. Uh, for 232 years, an accumulation of problems that resulted from the fact that the owners of slaves found it profitable to try to obliterate the humanity of the slaves. They didn't want to annihilate slaves. The obliteration was very different from the Holocaust, where the hatred in the Holocaust was so great until they wanted to annihilate people. The slaves were valuable property. Nobody wanted to annihilate them as, as living entities, but they wanted to annihilate their humanity. It was profitable to have them become more efficient beast of, uh, beast of burden. Uh, it was profitable to have them operate more like machines. It was profitable not to have them establish bonds related to families it's profitable to, to continue the practice of refusing to recognize marriages, families, to sell children away from parents, to uh, deny any sense of uh, belonging among families or any sense of uh, a society with ha which had mores and traditions before it came to these shores. Every effort was made to obliterate any past uh, traditions and any things which established the humanity of the African slaves. Great injustices were, justice were done. Uh, the Emancipation Proclamation and more importantly, the 13th Amendment, 14th Amendment, 15th Amendment began to change all that. But there are some residues that still exist. And because of those residues, uh, because of the kind of damage that was done over the 232 year period, it's its lingering after effects, we still need to have distinctions which cl clearly tell who the descendants of African Americans, uh, of the African American slaves were. Other groups may have other kinds of concerns, but we don't, we don't want to have obliterated at this point that distinction before the justice, uh, if not the justice, at least the truth and the, and, and the recognition of the injustice is confronted. I wholeheartedly applaud the president's efforts to raise the level of the race uh, dialogue on race relations and the dialogue on a multiracial society, to raise it to a new level. We are the indispensable nation, as the president said in his inaugural address. We are the indispensable nation. Uh, and uh, in order to remain in that position, we ought to try to build on the positive, the positive factors that flow out of being a very diversified society. society. We are a diverse society ethnically, but we have a problem. At the heart of our diversity, there is still a core problem related to the relationship between blacks and whites, and this grows out of the long years of slavery. And the descendants of slaves, uh, just probably as the descendants of Native Americans, have a special distinction. And that special distinction should be kept for a long time to come until we deal with the problems that the long years of oppression and injustice uh, generated. I thank you. Thank the gentleman. Uh, we will now begin with our members panel. Uh, will Representatives Thomas Sawyer of Ohio, Representative Thomas Petri of Wisconsin, Representative Maxine Waters of California, and Representative John Conyers of Michigan please come forward. I think Mr. Sawyer is second there. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to call on uh, Mr. Sawyer and Mr. Petri first because they are 
former chairman and ranking member of the committee that had jurisdiction over the census uh, before it was merged into uh, the Committee on Government Reform and Oversight at the beginning of 1995. And we have looked to them as our experts in this area, and they have been kind enough to come to a number of our hearings and testify on various aspects of the, cen of the census. So we will begin with Representative Sawyer of Ohio. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, um, I'm grateful for your designation as an expert. I, I guess I would um, say thank you and, and recognize that, uh, that maybe the most that we can claim is that we have long familiarity with this issue as a matter of, uh, of census practice and other statistical systems of the United States. In that sense, I'm, I'm grateful to you and uh, Congresswoman Maloney and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to share some additional thoughts uh, beyond those that I shared at your last hearing on this subject as you continue to review the categories for uh, collecting data on race and ethnicity in the 2000 census. Let me begin by congratulating OBM for all of the work that they've done on this important issue. After three years of careful and thorough consideration of alternative ways to measure race and ethnicity, OMB has recently released its proposed recommendations for Directive 15. I, uh, while I believe that its recommendations properly address the concerns on those on both sides of the multiracial issue. Uh, I, w I would really like to begin and end today by encouraging OMB to address something that you discussed, and that is establishing guidelines for how the federal government is to tabulate and publish and use these data. Uh, when I testified in April, I discussed the importance of understanding what racial categories are and what they are not. Clearly, they are culturally determined uh, descriptors that reflect uh, societal concerns and perceptions. They are not grounded in, in genetic or anthropological or scientific bases, and they're not fixed and unchanging. OMB has historically sought to establish categories, therefore, that are discrete, that are few in number, that are easy to use because they are broadly understood, and which yield consistent response. The categories are also intended to maintain continuity and comparability of that data over time. That's a tall order, but I believe OMB's recommendations meet those goals. First, the task force that dealt with this was composed of 30 federal agencies who regularly use racial and ethnic data. The panel voted unanimously to recommend that a, to OBM, OMB, that uh, a multiracial category not be used when collecting racial and ethnic data. Instead, they suggested that individuals be given the opportunity to provide multiple responses to the race questions when they identify personally with more than one category. Second, they recommended that Hispanic remain as a separate ethnic category and not be added as a new racial category. Additionally, they found through testing that arranging the Hispanic uh, origin question so that it preceded the the so-called race question proved to minimize confusion. Uh, this is important uh, to yield a more accurate count, particularly among all of the populations that have been undercounted in past censuses. Taken together, these recommendations, in my opinion, are an important step forward in measuring racial and ethnic change that is currently taking place in our country and may, in fact, be a fundamental characteristic of our age. By providing respondents with the choice to mark all that apply, OMB satisfies a compelling human need for self-identity while allowing for measurement in the aggregate of the changing racial and ethnic makeup of our nation. Adopting OMB's recommendation would also enable us to preserve with consistency the comparability and continuity of data over time. While its recommendations are sound, let me again urge OMB to look carefully at the data that will be produced by this new collection system and accompanying the, accompany these changes with clear and meaningful guidelines for tabulating and publishing and using the data once it's collected. Let me give you an example. The Civil Rights Division of uh, the Justice Department is charged with enforcing the Fair Housing Act. Uh, it prohibits discrimination in the granting of home mortgages. 
Monitoring and enforcement generally involve a comparison of census data with reports of lending activity for minority applicants for a specific geographical area. If the census data on race and ethnicity for a given census tract includes a percentage of residents who checked off white and black or Asian American, the question is, should the Justice Department consider that portion of the population to be minority or non-minority for the purposes of determining whether there is a pattern of discrimination in that neighborhood. It is particularly important to understand how and when to use aggregated or disaggregated data when more than one category is checked. There are not easy answers to this and similar kinds of questions, but they need to be clear because uh, the soundness of OBM's, o OMB's proposed changes to Directive 15 must be judged in part by whether clear and consistent guidelines can be developed to provide a rational and consistent response that is comparable with similar data over time. Otherwise, the federal government may inadvertently erase the gains that the nation has made over the last few decades in an effort to create a more inclusive society. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, the opportunity that you and members of the subcommittee have given to participate in your continued oversight of this important issue. I think the gentleman put his finger on the key question, and I now yield to his colleague that has spent uh, many years working with the census, uh, Mr. Petra of Wisconsin. He's the introducer of the Tiger Woods Bill, H.R. 830 of the House of Representatives, which would create a multiracial category. Mr. Petra. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this hearing and continuing to take an interest in the issue of racial categorization. Last April, I testified before this committee on behalf of uh, the bill you referred to, H.R. 830, to add a multiracial category to the census and other federal forms which ask respondents to categorize themselves by race. In the course of that testimony, I briefly mentioned some concerns with how the data would be tabulated if, instead of a multiracial category, we were to allow people to check more than one of the existing categories. As you know, the Office of Management and Budget recently issued its preliminary recommendations, which indeed call for a check all that apply system. I'd like to reemphasize that there should be at least one compilation of data from the race uh, issue on the census uh, in which the total is not greater than 100 percent, and therefore in which multiracial individuals are included as a separate group in. Uh, tabulate it when the tabulation occurs. The numbers can be tabulated in several different ways, of course, and if the Bureau wants to publish information about how many people checked off a certain category, including multiracials who checked off that one and another, I certainly have no objection, and it might be useful information for certain purposes. If that's done with each of the categories, those who check off more than one category will be counted more than once, but for some uses of the data, that may be okay. For other purposes, however, it's necessary in order for policymakers to get a clear picture of the situation that the individual categories do not add up to more than 100 percent of the total. Thus, we need one compilation in which multiracial individuals who have checked more than one box are counted in their own category and only in that uh, category. Uh, these two ways of compiling the data, and perhaps still others, are not mutually exclusive. I've been briefed by OMB officials on their plans for compiling, compiling the data, and I was encouraged by that briefing. Officials there seem to be aware of the need for data in which multiracial individuals are grouped together separately from the other categories. Although I'd like to see a separate box on the form for the multiracial category, counting separately those who have checked more than one box comes close, and if the OMB follows through, would, in my opinion, accomplish the goals of uh, H.R. 830, and I thank you for allowing me to appear here this morning. Well, again, I think the gentleman's put his finger on one of the key questions. If people do not like the multiracial aspect, maybe we just check a category that says, I have checked more than one above, and we'll get into that with the uh, chief statistician of the United States and the representatives of the Office of Management and Budget. I now uh, yield to the uh, gentlewoman from California, uh, Ms. Maxine Waters. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to testify before the subcommittee today. The subject of today's hearing is one which potentially impacts 
uh, every African-American citizen in our country. The recent federal interagency recommendation that the Office of Management and Budget made changes, make changes to its current standards for measuring race and ethnicity. The interagency committee, a task force with representation from 30 federal agencies, recently rejected the proposal for creation of a multiracial category, but recommended that individuals be permitted to select one or more of the current categories of race used in the census. Today, I join with this viewpoint, which is shared by several civil rights organizations, including the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, the National Urban League, the NAACP, and the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies in strong opposition to the addition of a multiracial classification to the 2000 census. The use of a multiracial or biracial category in the 2000 census would jeopardize the ability of individuals in the United States to seek legal redress for continued racial discrimination. Currently, the United States has, substan has made substantial progress. We still have substantial progress to make in the area of racial equality. There's discrimination practiced daily in housing, employment, voting rights, and education. Federal law enforcement efforts to deter such discrimination often use data collected pursuant to Directive 15 and the United States Census. Legal redress of persistent racial and ethnic discrimination is contingent on current racial classifications, which show disparities in racial treatment in a variety of instances. I believe that the inclusion of a multiracial or biracial classification is counterproductive to effectively enforcing the civil rights laws of this country. Directive 15 has been indispensable in facilitating the information required to move the nation's equal opportunity agenda forward. The data compiled under this policy have been used to enforce requirements of the Voting Rights Act, to review state redistricting plans, to establish and uh, evaluate uh, programs and plans to get rid of uh, discrimination both in the public and private sector, to monitor and enforce desegregation plans in the public schools, to assist minority businesses under the, the Minority Business Development Program, and to monitor and enforce the Fair Housing Act. You also heard from uh, Congressman Sawyer how the Humda data is used. I serve on the Banking Committee, and that information has been extremely valuable in helping the banks and financial institutions of this country correct their lending practices. When they unveiled this valuable data and they saw that loans were being made to whites uh, who had less income, who had less favorable paying records, et cetera, et cetera, and able to compare that uh, in communities and census tracts where minorities had been turned down, even though they had uh, the income, uh, they had the records, they had all that uh, you would think would cause uh, a bank to lend uh, to them to buy homes, it was not being done. The record indicates that significant improvements have incur occurred in all of these respects, and for nearly two decades, Directive 15 has been greatly instrumental in that progress. However, the evidence is equally clear that much more remains to be done. Racial discrimination is still prevalent in American life, and the residual effects of past discrimination continue to limit progress. Recently publicized discrimination cases, such as that involving Texaco's executives, referring to African Americans as black jelly beans in their boardroom, are highly instructive on the persistence of discriminatory treatment based on race. In closing, I would emphasize that I will continue to resist any effort to complicate, reduce, or deter progress toward equal opportunity and racial fairness in American society. The multiracial proposal poses a risk to the ability of federal agencies to collect useful data on racial classifications. For this reason, I must vigorously oppose any use of multiracial a category in the 2000 census. Um, 
Mr. Chairman, uh, prior to closing, I'd just like to say that I had an opportunity to look over Mr. Uh, Genrich's um, testimony, where he had some discussion in here of Tiger Woods. Uh, and I wanted to engage him in some discussions about another golfer, whose name is Mr. Lee Elder, who was a prominent um, golfer. And when he was young, like Tiger Woods, he would have loved to have been able to participate. Um, I think that his handicap was probably zero. And he was excluded for all of the years. And finally, a big fight was put up to get him finally on the senior tour. And after many, many years and long fighting and organizing by African Americans and some others, we finally got him on the senior tour maybe about eight, nine, ten years ago. Uh, if he had had the opportunity to participate uh, back when uh, he was young as Tiger Woods, uh, you would have seen another Tiger Woods a long time ago. But that story can be told time and time again. Yes, Tiger Woods is extraordinary, but we would like to live in a society where someday uh, other African Americans with handicaps of 10, 8, and 9 can get to compete just like whites do uh, out on these tours. Uh, all of those, um, well, let me just say it this way. We should not have to be super, super, super stars to be able to integrate, whether it's golf or anything else. We should be afforded the same opportunity that any other average American is afforded. And while people can point to Tiger Woods and try and relate this to uh, our need to have a multiracial category, let me assure you that this super, super, super human being um, is a fabulous young man, but there are a lot of other fabulous young African Americans, had they had the opportunity to participate, like a Lee Elder, too, would have excelled uh, on the same tours. Thank you very much. We thank you. Uh, it's now good to see back the gentleman who presided for many years in this room, a former chairman of what was then government operations. Mr. Conyers of Michigan, the ranking Democrat on the Committee on Judiciary. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Mrs. Maloney, members of the committee. I'm very pleased to uh, be here with you today uh, to continue this very important dialogue. And uh, I look forward to uh, being here with the Speaker of the House. Uh, it, it indicates how important this matter is. Of course, we can understand his busy schedule and the prevalence of coups on the Hill makes it rather difficult for him to always be where he wants to be. So let's just hope that all is well uh, on the Republican side. Uh, well, most of us hope all that is well on the <laughs> Republican side and that the speaker will, will soon be able to uh, join us in this important discussion that has been going on in this committee. I commend you all. First of all, because we can talk about this and lower our voices and, and keep the rhetoric to as low a minimum as is possible uh, on the Hill. The president invited the nation to do that. And I think we're doing that if, if we have this discussion in the manner that we have been. I commend all of my colleagues at the table. Uh, they've, they've done an enormously important job and have been working at this for quite a while. I am heartened by Mr. Petrie, my dear friend, indicating that he might, be do, he might be willing to do something that I'd been thinking about yesterday, because I asked to testify last night. Uh, this was, wasn't something I was planning for a long time. But the reason I, 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 I thought that there might be something in here that we could talk about, because I 
feel that it's important that we identify who's in this country, not only from the national point of view, but from the point of view of the people who are in the country. They, they, they have a right to be identified. Nobody decided to pick mixed par parentage. As a matter of fact, nobody decided to be black or white. So we, we come here trying to untangle a legislative problem that has very deep social roots. And the, the one improvement that I might be willing to consider, and my chairperson of the Congressional Black Caucus always deeply influences my legislative thought processes, <laughs> especially when she's sitting, sitting so close to me. <laughs> uh, the one thing that I might be willing to consider is the, the identification of a, a category in which people would be allowed to check more than one box. Now, why does that become important? It become, becomes important because some people want to let everybody know of their parentage, just as I and I presume all of you are proud of, but they don't, they don't want to become the victim of what Major Owen said, a, a, a category in a, a government office. They would also like to indicate their preference, if you are biracial, of which identity they choose. And, and I thought I heard the gentleman from Wisconsin indicate that such a, a further rethinking of his legislation uh, would be possible. And, and it's in that vein that I come to this hearing to express interest. I had no idea the gentleman was going to take the words out of my mouth this morning. And, and I'm, I'm, very, I'm very happy about that. And so uh, please count me in on this dialogue. As you can see, my my views are, are not in concrete here, but I think that there is a constructive discussion going on, and I, I thank you for allowing me to participate in it. Now, I, I close on a subject that's not on the, uh, on the agenda today, but I, I urge the continued openness that I hear here, and that's with the subject of sampling. Uh, please. If you're bringing uh, open minds and, and uh, you know, stretching your understandings of this to the limit, please don't not apply it to the subject of sampling because in some respects, uh, here we're dealing with a, a way of remedying an admitted problem a problem that everyone has confessed that we've been undercounting African Americans by the millions for decades. And we're trying to figure out how to do it. So we want to keep those avenues as open as well. And I thank you for the generosity of your time, Chairman Horn. Uh, we thank the gentleman for coming. Uh, I will now yield five minutes to Mr. Davis of Virginia to begin the questioning for the majority, and then we Thank will you. alternate with the minority. Thank you. Uh, let me start, Mr. Conyers. I was reading your written statement, which is a little bit at variance to what you said orally. Your written statement says, I'm going to propose a solution, and throughout it says, my solution, my solution, and then you get up here and you sit next to Mrs. Waters, and you said you might be willing to consider your solution. And I don't, I don't know, Ms. Waters, if you've looked at Mr. Conyers' a proposed solution, what you think of that. No, I have not, but I listened to his statement, and I think what I heard him say is um, he knows there's a need uh, to um, solve this problem. He's still somewhat open. He was pleased to hear Mr. Petrie this morning talk about uh, a multiracial category and other categories that could be checked by someone who falls in that definition. So what I really heard was Mr. Conyers uh, coming here to seek a solution with somewhat of an open mind. How, do, you, do you agree with that? 
having, in other words, you could check multiracial and then go down and check no, your individual? No, I came with a little bit different point of view. However, uh, I do not think that we should uh, simply um, disregard uh, Mr. Petrie's uh, testimony or Mr. Kanye's desire to give further thought to it. I came uh, pretty much uh, um, decided that, in fact, the work that is being done by the interagency task force with the background and the experience really should be paid attention to. These agencies are looking at all that they must do with the forms that they have in their various agencies and how we can have some consistency in government and what would make sense for everybody. So when I took a look at their work, I thought the recommendation not to have a multiracial category, but to have a number of categories that people could check made a lot of sense. Then I questioned them very closely that if someone checked more than one category, how then would you count? And they are in the process now of making that determination. I would really like to see them continue that work so that we can have the benefit of concentrated effort in making sense out of all of this. Okay. While all of us uh, have some opinions, and we deal with 999 things on any given day, none of us are as concentrated and as focused as the interagency task force that's uh, designed okay. to do this kind of work. So Th that's where you. I'm coming from. Thank you. Mr. Petro, let me ask you. In your written testimony, you make reference to the need for data in which multiracial individuals are grouped together separately from other categories. What are some specific needs, whether in public policy, research, or elsewhere, do you think, for data on the variety of people selecting more than one race? Well, I think uh, there are a couple of reasons for uh, having people select more than one race. When Tom Sawyer and I had these, when he scheduled the hearings and I attended uh, and uh, to review the 1990 census, a number of individuals and perhaps a few representing small groups or uh, newly organized groups came forward and said they did not think it was fair for their uh, children to be forced to choose between one half of their heritage and another half of their heritage, that they uh, may have had a Korean uh, mother and an American black father, and why couldn't they say that instead of having to say that they were black or say that they were Asian or whatever it happened to be. And I found that uh, persuasive and thought that it made sense to not to force people into that uh, untenable or an uncomfortable position. My solution was to say, well, maybe we should have the current categories or whatever the experts think makes sense. And then, by the way, if they don't fit, uh, provide another category. It wasn't as off-putting as other, which sounds sort of whatever, uh, but that they could, that would reflect the fact they were multiracial. And that's what the bill provided for. But the panel of uh, some 30 agency representatives under OMB's uh, direction came up with the idea of why not just instead of directing people to choose only one category, period, say choose one or more than one as you feel appropriate, then that el eliminates the uh, uh, uncomfortable situation that we were forcing people in by requiring them to choose just one. So that's one benefit. Uh, now I, my testimony basically goes to how is that going to be presented for uh, useful purposes by <coughs> policymakers at the state level and national level and business and so on. It seems to me if when they do the compilation of the census, the different categories total more than 100% in a particular area, it starts getting very confusing for redistricting, for example. Uh, so it, at least in one iteration, and I don't, they can do it many different ways, uh, they ought to have something where, whether it's called multiracial or people who check more than one box or whatever, a separate category so that all of the percentages total 100%. That's the point of my testimony here today. How it can be used, there are many different ways it can be uh, useful to show that it, the sense is supposed to be an accurate picture of the American population at a particular point in time. I think this would make it more accurate. Uh, I guess. Thank you. Mm -hmm. you anything to that, Mr. If, if I can add something, I, I, I am not going to disagree with what Tom has, has said. Let me just say, though, that it is important that the data be collected in a way that makes it possible to tabulate in a variety of ways for a variety of purposes so that they can be aggregated and disaggregated 
for specific applications. This proposal makes that possible. A multiracial category on its own would not and would, I believe, add to the confusion in the terms in, that Tom has just described rather than to clarify it. I believe that what, uh, what the multi-agency task force has suggested will yield the result that all four of us across here are talking about. Thank you. We thank the gentleman. I now yield five minutes to the ranking member, Ms. Maloney of New York, for the purpose of questioning the witnesses. Th thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I, I welcome all the witnesses, particularly the former chair on the committee on which I serve, and, and uh, Mr. Sawyer, Mr. Petrie, the two former chairs of the subcommittee, and, and really I want to thank you for the many hours that you have uh, dedicated so far in, in testifying uh, before this committee, and always, Maxine, you you add a lot of spark to all the hearings you participate in. It's always good to see you. I would, I would like to um, ask the same question to each of you. The, the voting rights uh, laws and the civil rights laws were, were written to, to really address discrimination against uh, certain groups of people. And should we accept the, the um, recommendations of the interagency task force, which allowed individuals to check various combinations of their heritage that they feel they are in, in their self-expression, should that person check um, one of the areas of, uh, of, of, of protected uh, status? Uh, would that person be in a protected group in terms of civil rights laws and voting rights laws? Let me begin by referring to uh, Directive 15. I can only assume that the same kinds of, of uh, limitations that apply to Directive 15 today would apply in the future. And that is to understand that the, uh, that the purpose for which these categories are used is not for pers personal identification nor qualification for uh, eligibility for any federal program. It is used to provide aggregate measurement of populations in ways that reflect the reality of the nation. Uh, so it should, it, it's very important to understand that these categories are not used for eligibility identification. Uh, rather, it's so that we can understand the direction and the shape and the change of the country in the aggregate and in its many components. Yeah, the census, at least in the case of the census form, it's confidential. It's guaranteed to be confidential. All information provided is absolutely confidential, cannot be used by federal law or any other uh, to be uh, uh, in any way benefit or hurt an individual. So this, this, the answer to your question really is uh, what will the courts, lawyers, administrators make of this change in data? And I, I don't know. I would think myself that an individual would uh, still have all of the protections that they have now. Many people are being forced into one category or another who are, in fact, multiracial. They still deserve protection, and I don't think this would lessen it. Mm -hmm. May I just in, go back and, and, and read from Directive 15? These classifications should not be interpreted as being scientific or anthropological in nation, nature. We've already talked about that. Nor should they be viewed as determinants of eligibility for participation in any federal program. And it's a fundamental underlying principle of these categories. And I just, uh, Maxine? I mm -hmm. yeah. um, it's an interesting subject that the committee that I now serve on is going to watch carefully, too. Uh, I'm not asking you to share jurisdiction this morning or anything <laughs> like that. Mm -hmm. But um, obviously, as has been referred to by many of us this morning, uh, we, we don't need any more monkeying with the civil rights and voter rights legislation in America. And I don't think there's a, a member in this room that would support anything that would have that effect. And I think that the, the gentleman from Ohio's rereading of 15 uh, keeps us all on the same point. And I, I agree with you, Tom. I just have one uh, last question. I'd just uh, like to ask each of you, uh, yes or no, do you uh, support the recommendations of the interagency task force? Yes. 
As I understand it, I do. I express my concern about how the data that's collected is presented, but I, uh, and I, I assume that when they think about it, they will uh, not add, at least have one thing that doesn't more, total more than 100 percent, but I, in some ways it's better than 830. Yes, I certainly do, and I think um, the recommendation that they have come forth with so far is uh, reasonable, it is logical, and I think it satisfies, basically, uh, most concerns, and I await uh, the additional information that will further explain the tabulating of that, and uh, I'm really pleased to have this concentrated group of uh, individuals who work in all of these agencies working on this. Well, I'm, I'm not a... I'm not a wishy-washy guy, but my staff instructed me to say, for the most part. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm okay. I'll find out what that means, but <laughs> Mr. Mr. Davis, I, I hope, will give me permission to revise my statement so that it'll comport with what I said, uh, with what was written for me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. Mm -hmm. Thank the gentlewoman. I yield five minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Portman, for questioning the witnesses. Thank the panelists for the information today. This is my first hearing on this. I'm the newest member of this committee. I came back, uh, Chairman Conyers, after uh, being away for a few years. I was on with you for my first year. And uh, so I'm really am, am, am new at this uh, uh, issue and probably reflect, therefore, most of the other members of the Congress who have not had the opportunity to spend as much time on this and found uh, both the opening statements of my colleagues here interesting as well as uh, informative and, and yours. I have a couple very elementary questions, I suppose. First is, it, it does seem important to me that all of us understand better, not those of us, uh, not those of you here, but those of us in, in the Congress who are not so close to it, what this data is used for. I think I have a better sense of that now, Tom, after your explanation. And uh, this is really aggregate data. It's not for eligibility for a specific program, but it's, it's, it's data that would be uh, used for such things as redistricting, probably the most sensitive issue, uh, but other general uh, directional policy questions uh, where you need to have the aggregate. And with, with that in mind, I guess my, my fundamental question is, how do you avoid the double counting? I'm, I'm intrigued. I, I did read your statement, uh, John, and then also heard your, your oral statement. And it seems to me to give people an opportunity to, to uh, identify themselves as multiracial, if indeed they are, and view themselves that way is only fair. Uh, on the other hand, <clears throat> one would uh, want to have a further breakdown, as you indicate in your written statement. And it seems to me inevitable then you have double counting. And uh, how, how do you avoid that? Can someone respond to that for me? Yes. Uh, having never thought about this subject that you've asked me before in my life, uh, let me say that it is my view that double counting is not the world's worst thing. I mean, we're not trying... There's, there's one way to get a total number of the people in the United States. The fact that some of the total number of people check more than one box, I don't think will even throw the Census Bureau people off too much. I mean, this is not rocket science. Uh, some people check two boxes. So don't Census Department add up all the boxes and say we got more than 100%. Got it, Census? So, so my view is that this may be, you know, a, a complex problem, but from this point of view of this member, I, I just don't see that as what we really have to worry about too much. Other panelists seem interested. Maybe I'm going to talk urge you them. strongly to ask the the folks from uh, OMB uh, about this and to refer that question specifically to the the career professionals at the census. But what John just said is correct. Each response counts as a single response. Mm -hmm. It may have more than one dimension to it, but that does not count for more than one response. And so that each person responding only counts as one person no matter how many different categories they may check. Yeah, i just add, to, if they, uh, people were going to be counted as more than one response if they check more than one box, I guarantee you for redistricting purposes, I will work as hard as I can to get everyone in Wisconsin to check every box on the census form. <laughs> <laughs> and I suspect every other governor you'd have, you'd and You'd have four or five more members of Congress in, from Wisconsin. And the country will do exactly the same. So uh, what, we, what we are 
wanting to do is to have a more accurate census and not put people in and accommodate changes in our mm -hmm. population mm -hmm. and not have a not not uh, and uh, and it seems to me that checking more than one and then doing a uh, those who checked more than one or multiracial cut on it doing other cuts on it all makes sense I would think it'd be a mistake to myself in, to, in doing the total to try to de-aggregate it. So if someone checked three boxes, say, well, the, we'll add one third of a vote to this category and another third to that category and so on. Uh, I, that strikes me as probably c c easily creating confusion rather than uh, making a more accurate uh, but, uh, situation. But Tom, so, it's sociology and in our society, some people think of themselves as mixed, so why not admit it that, uh, and reflect that? But in let, me, let me just add Clarify one, one point then for, for my edification, maybe I missed something here, but you indicated earlier that you supported the interagency recommendation which rejects the idea of a multiracial category. Is that correct? I th no, it doesn't really reject the notion of a multiracial category. It accommodates the concern for I had in introducing legislation to provide for a multiracial category, which was that if, you, if you're told you must classify yourself as one or another and you don't feel as uh, Tiger Woods is an example, and a lot of other people, that that is accurate, that you're a bit of each. You, you're, you're right now not accommodated in the census form. Telling people they, they, that they could check multiracial struck me as a way of solving that problem. Mm -hmm. The census uh, task force thinks uh, telling people that they don't have to check just one, they can do more than one, mm -hmm. that's fine too. When it's presented then though, my only concern is that you then don't uh, go ahead and end up with 110 or 120 percent right. in your totals that you then when you present you end up if you want to call it a multiracial category or whatever uh, you would have a separate category for statistical reporting purposes that would reflect those who checked more than one box but that that's still that, you know, I, I will I will yield back to the chairman because we have a vote because my time is up to wait until they come back with a recommendation about how to do it okay and I'm just reserving my opinion on that aspect of it until they come back having given some real thought to it to suggest to us how it should be done. But Maxine, are yeah. you still concerned, and this goes to your written statement, John, really, that given that, as I understand the procedure you're suggesting, Tom, still individuals who consider themselves to be multiracial might not have the opportunity at the outset to identify themselves in that manner. Is that correct? No, no they would. No. They would. They would because they could put down uh, black and Asian or black, Asian and uh, 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 Caucasian or uh, so they would have the opportunity to identify themselves by one or more that's right yeah you wouldn't have to choose ethnicity your but not, not, not as multiracial you could put as down a both your bit of each if, if I if I might offer a clarification <clears throat> the question that Tom is concerned about is one of tabulation we don't want to have tabulation that confuses the issue about how many people we're talking about. The issue that we're dealing about here is one of identification as you fill out the form. The recommendations that all of us are suggesting to, to MB is that they make sure that in their instructions that the tabulation be done with absolute clarity. So they're Thank two you. separate questions. Thank you, Chairman. I uh, yield uh, five minutes for the purpose of questioning to the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Uh, I might add before he begins, we have a vote in progress, 15 minutes to get over there. There might be other votes. Uh, this is a, a motion on the previous question. So we will try to complete the questioning. If you're not coming back, if you can come back, uh, we've got 15 minutes of questioning here, potentially. Okay. Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me just say that I appreciate the testimony of each one of our distinguished uh, witnesses. Um, let me just ask, we know that there are political as well as cultural consequences of the census. And I observed as I listened to the dialogue, it occurred to me that if all of us were as close and congenial as the four of you, that in all probability we could work out with relative ease most situations that we face. But my question is, looking at the political and cultural implications, in your minds, does one outweigh the other? Or how do we consider the two? 
I think what I'm looking for are some instructions for OMB. I know, Representative Waters, you indicated that you wanted to hear their position, but I think that this may be an excellent opportunity to give them some ideas and instructions as they wrestle with what these boxes would actually mean. Well, uh, Mr. Davis, let me just say, I, I, I agree with the first recommendation to check more to be able to check more than one box. I think that is a good, sound recommendation. And I think that um, uh, that recommendation takes care of the concern about those who see themselves as multiracial. And there's no need for a box called multiracial. I don't have a clue about how to tabulate it. That's a different question. I don't know, and I have no recommendation about how they would take a box or, I mean, uh, an individual who checks three boxes and tabulate that and so that you don't get more than 100%. I just don't know how to do that. But I, I, I would like to add, and this may be a little bit outside of your question, that for those people who may be concerned about having a multiracial category, they may be of the opinion that this information is somehow seen and identified with them as an individual, when in fact it is not. Uh, this information compiled and used in, in a general way uh, needs to be explained, I think, to the public so that people won't think that uh, Ms. Jones uh, is somehow going to be identified other than what Ms. Jones believes she is because they've checked this form. It does not work that way. What Ms. Jones needs to understand is if she is not given the opportunity to check a category that would ensure that uh, we protect her from discrimination and we're able to count in ways that will identify where certain things are occurring and help to make those corrections that, uh, you know, she must understand she'll be a lot better off in the society by having those kinds of protections than not. And that's the kind of discussion we've not had an opportunity to get into in this overall education process. Anyone, either, either one of you. I don't have a University of Chicago in my district, Danny, so I can't deal with these kind of questions this morning. <laughs> we'll help you. <laughs> well, let me just say, and I think it's time to go, really. I think you raise a very interesting point because many of the individuals with whom I have spoken who indicated that they were looking for a multiracial category have indicated that it was a very personal feeling an item to them. And we've often suggested to them that yes, that's important, and that's one thing, but just as important as your personal feelings really is where you fit as part of a group, especially if you're a member of a minority group and you're seeking equal protection and equal opportunity under the law. So I thank you very much. Thank you. We thank the gentleman. Committee stands in recess for roughly 12 minutes. a tradition on this uh, subcommittee, which is an investigating subcommittee, of swearing all witnesses but members to the oath as to their testimony. So if you would stand, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The clerk will note that all four witnesses affirm the oath. 
and we'll just take them in the order that they are in our agenda, and that means we begin with Susan Graham, uh, president of Project Race. Now, I believe you're from Georgia, are you, Ms. Graham? Yes, I am from Georgia. Well, the speaker had very much hoped to be here to introduce you, but he and Mr. Lott and a few of the White House people are working together, so that'll have to be postponed, so please begin. Okay, thank you. I'm pleased to be with you again today, representing the national membership of Project Race. I testified before this subcommittee on May 22nd about the plight of multiracial children in America who are without a racial classification. My son Ryan also testified. He told you that he wants a classification that describes exactly who he is, multiracial. This time I've brought two other young ladies from Georgia along with me. They have a vested interest. They're both multiracial. One is my daughter, Megan Graham, and the other is Ashley Miller. Ashley's mother filed a suit against OMB so that Ashley and her brother could be considered multiracial. I've been asked to come back today to address the interagency recommendation to the Office of Management and Budget. The national membership of Project Race expressed feelings of elation at Mark one or more part of the recommendation. For the first time in the history of this country, our multiracial children will not have to choose just one race. It is progress. But after the elation came the sad truth. Under the current recommendation, my children and millions of children like them merely become check all that apply kids or check more than one box children or more than one race persons. They will be known as multiple check offs or half and halfers. Or as John Hope Franklin, chairman of President Clinton's Race Relations Commission, referred to them, half white Negroes and half black whites. They are none of the above. They are multiracial children. The worldwide, worldwide readership of interracial voice and the national membership of A Place for Us join with Project Race in strongly advocating for a multiracial category. We want the message to be very clear. Multiracial children exist and the federal government recognizes them. You must understand that the proposal in effect says multiracial persons are only parts of other communities. They are not whole. When I was in school, one half plus one half equaled a whole. I think it still does, unless you're multiracial. Let's be very clear, the compromise for check one or more without a multiracial identifier was not a compromise with the multiracial community. It was a compromise with the opponents of the category. I have brought short comments from Project Race members from across the country of all ages and races, voicing their opinions about the recommendation and the need for the multiracial classification. I ask that they be entered into the record. With that objection, uh, they'd be in the record at this Thank point. You. Representatives of OMB stated in a media briefing held on July 8, 1997, that a multiracial classification would, quote, no doubt add to racial tension and further fragmentation of our population. This statement is racist, untrue, and inflammatory. In the seven states which currently have a multiracial category, there have been no racial, has been no racial tension or fragmentation of the population as a result of the multiracial classification. In fact, people of all races have been glad to have the multiracial category. I have heard of no race riots, hate crimes, protests, or the slightest bit of tension in those seven states because of the multiracial classification. And incidentally, uh, those seven states include uh, Mr. Sawyer, Mr. Portman's state of Ohio, Mr. Conyers' state of Michigan, Mr. Davis's state of Illinois, and the Speaker Gingrich's state of Georgia. The interagency committee obviously rec recognizes the need for appropriate racial labels. They have recommended adding African American to the black category, changing Hawaiian to Native Hawaiian, and changing Alaskan Native to Alaska Native. Terms like Latino can be added to Hispanic. Why can't multiracial be used in addition to check more than one? Why is it unimportant to be multiracial, but important to be African American or Latino? Why does OMB object to the word multiracial? First, because they do not want to define the word. In fact, they don't have to define it at all. OMB Directive 15 should state, a multiracial person may have origins in two or more of the listed groups. OMB Directive 15 could state, multiracial persons can, but are not required to report more than one race, instead of persons of mixed racial origin. 
can but are not required to report more than one race. Second, some of the leadership of the other minority communities just do not like the term multiracial. Their irrational fear of loss of numbers was addressed during the last hearing. It is simply ridiculous that multiracial children should have to have the sanction and approval of other minority groups in order to have their own identity. Equally disturbing is the lack of information on how persons who check more than one box will be counted. The recommendation speaks of tabulation and algorithms. They say they won't be able to figure it out until January 1st, 1999. The recommendation states, quote, data producers are encouraged to provide greater detail about the distribution of multiple responses, encouraged but not mandated. There are 10 additional combinations under the check one or more scheme. Six persons who check two boxes, three persons who check three boxes, and one person who would check, or one, one person who would check four boxes. That's it. Ten combinations is all we're talking about. The only accurate and complete way for the government to report the breakdown of this racial group is to report on the additional ten categories under the major heading of multiracial. It should be mandatory to report this way. Not only is it the most accurate way to count, but it gives us the information absolutely necessary for medical purposes. To allow people to check more than one box and then revert to some kind of scheme to re-aggregate them into one racial category is discriminatory. It doesn't take 50 task forces and 50 government statisticians running around to find out how other countries do this to see how it can be done accurately. It certainly shouldn't take two years, and it should have been decided in the four years of OMB investigation. Thus, we are being asked to comment on a recommendation which has not answered a very important part of the outcome. I listened to comments of Representative Tom Sawyer the other day about sampling on the census. He repeatedly said, quote, the goal is accuracy, unquote. If the goal is accuracy for the argument of sampling, then the goal should be accuracy in counting those who do fill out their census forms. Can we afford to have two different standards when it comes to the accurate portrayal of the makeup of race in America? Further, it must be made very clear that respondents to race can report more than one race. It is not enough to have it hidden within OMB Statistical Directive 15. It must be stated clearly on forms. The Project Race recommendation, which we presented before, if you consider yourself to be biracial or multiracial, check as many as apply, is far more preferable to ambiguous language. We must have clarity if accuracy is our goal. I want to wrap up with talking about who is confused here. Uh, President Clinton said last week that his high-profile panel on race would focus on multiracialism, yet his administration is afraid to define multiracial. One of the reasons given by the interagency committee under findings not favoring adoption of a method for reporting more than one race are that there are no federal legislative requirements for information about the multiracial population. But there are also no federal legislative requirements for an African-American identifier either. This subcommittee should recommend passage of H.R. 830 so that no one is confused. Or as Mr. Conyers from Michigan said, uh, that we should include a multiracial category with the same questions uh, and checkoffs below it. Um, that would also be another way that we could do it. The recommendation is for an implementation of Mark One and More scheme by the year 2003. Is this so confusing that it will take six years to implement? My son, who first testified on this issue when he was eight years old, will be 18 years old in the year 2003. He will be old enough to vote and will still not have a multiracial classification. I wonder who he will vote for. When I told my son Ryan about the interagency recommendation, he looked at me and said, Mom, what's the federal government going to call me next? Gray? Why can't they let me be multiracial? Perhaps you can answer that question for him better than I. Thank you. We thank you uh, for your testimony. It's been very helpful. Uh, without objection, the testimony of Representative Carrie P. Meek will be put in the record at the end of uh, the members' panel. And we now go to uh, uh, Carlos Fernandez, Coordinator for Law and Civil Rights, Association of Multi-Ethnic Americans. Mr. Fernandez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Carlos Fernandez. I'm here speaking for myself and also on behalf of the Association of Multi-Ethnic Americans. Uh, I am the association's coordinator for law and civil rights and served as, as, as its founding president in 1988. 
The Association of Multi-Ethnic Americans is a nationwide confederation of multi-ethnic interracial groups representing thousands of people from all walks of life and includes individuals and families of various racial and ethnic origins and mixtures. On June 30th, 1993, I had the opportunity to testify on behalf of AMEA before the House Subcommittee on Census, Statistics, and Postal Personnel to present for the first time an overview of our concerns with respect to the acknowledgement of multiracial, multiethnic people by our government. I hereby incorporate that testimony herein by reference. Without objection, we put in the record at this point. Thank you. I submitted written testimony to this subcommittee this subcommittee in May of this year, reviewing the legal and constitutional issues which pertain to the government's racial and ethnic classifications as they affect multiracial, multiethnic individuals. I hereby also incorporate that testimony herein by reference. Without objection, be put in at this point. Following the enactment of the 1965 Civil, Civil Rights Act, the newly created Equal Employment Opportunity Commission I, required... I, I think you mean 1964. Excuse me. Yeah. There's a typo, yes. Required employers to report on the numbers of Negroes, Orientals, American Indians, and Spanish Americans and produce standard Form 100 for this purpose. Other agencies followed suit. By the 1970s, racial statistics gathered from agencies of government at all levels were becoming unwieldy and standardization was deemed necessary. Mindful of this, the Office of Management and Budget produced Statistical Policy Directive 15 in 1977. Directive 15 remains to this day the supreme authority for racial classifications in the United States, affecting all governmental agencies, including the census, the public schools, social security, and so forth. The directive also dictates classification policy to the private sector through the EEOC, the Small Business Administration, as well as by way of example. OMB Directive 15 sets forth five racial ethnic categories, white, black, Asian Pacific Islander, Native American, Alaska Native, and Hispanic. Additionally, the directive requires reporting in one category only for each individual counted, the so-called check one only rule. Other is not one of the reporting categories. Directive 15's stated purpose is to require government agencies at all levels to design their racial and ethnic query forms in such a way that the information provided can be reported in terms of one of the Directive 15 categories only. Thus, people whose parentage encompasses more than one of the designated categories cannot be counted except monoracially. No reason is stated as to why an individual must report in only one category. The OMB's Interagency Committee for the Review of the Racial and Ethnic Standards announced this month its recommendations regarding OMB Statistical Directive 15. In particular, the Interagency Committee recommended that Directive 15 be amended to permit multiple checkoffs on government forms whenever racial and ethnic information is requested. Additionally, the Interagency Committee specifically ruled out the addition of a new classification for multiracial individuals. The Interagency Committee did not issue any proposed draft for the amended Directive 15. The Committee recommended that the proposed changes be used in the 2000 decennial census and that all agencies conform to the changes no later than January 1st, 2003. There was no mention as to whether a, a, any agency might be permitted to implement the proposed changes before the year 2000. The Association of Multi-Ethnic Americans and allied organizations and individuals regard the Interagency Committee's recommendations as a necessary and revolutionary change. If implemented appropriately, we believe the proposed changes to OMB Directive 15 will meet our most fundamental concern, namely acknowledgement by our government that multiracial, multiethnic people do in fact exist and have a right to be counted. Additionally, the proposed changes will resolve the legal and constitutional problems presented by the current Directive 15, which I pointed out to this subcommittee in May. While we had proposed that the directive be changed to also include a new classification for multiracial, multiethnic individuals, a proposal that we stand by, we nonetheless regard the Interagency Committee's recommendations as the best compromise possible at this time and will wholeheartedly support them. There are, however, three major concerns we have about the final wording of the amended Directive 15, all of which are, in our view, critical. One, Directive 15 must ensure that the total number 
of individuals returning multiple responses to racial and ethnic questions can be discerned. The tabulation procedure to be adopted must be one that allows us to distinguish both the numbers and composition of people returning multiple responses. Our understanding is that the OMB wishes to ensure this as well and has solicited assistance in devising a practical means to accomplish this. Without such a tabulation, the numbers of multiracial, multiethnic people will be lost among the other classifications. Among other things, this would impede assessing the health needs of our population and would serve no fathomable purpose. Directive 15 must, inclear, must include clear language that will allow for multiple checkoffs for individuals who are both Hispanic and non-Hispanic. It would be grossly inconsistent and again would serve no fathomable purpose to single out one particular segment of the population by denying them the same right to indicate in a factual manner their identity. The Interagency Committee's recommendations were unclear on this point, making reference only to racial identification and saying nothing about whether the amended Directive 15 will retain its dual interchangeable formats, one of which racializes the Hispanic classification, the other which treats Hispanics as an ethnic group. And third, Directive 15 must not include any prohibition on the use of a multiracial, multiethnic classification by any government agency. The Interagency Committee recommended against the addition of a multiracial, ethnic classification but said nothing about explicitly prohibiting the use of such an identifier by any agency subject to Directive 15. The committee explained its position by saying that, quote, having a separate category would in effect create another population group and no, no doubt add to racial tension and further fragmentation of our population, unquote. We do not agree with this opinion of the interagency committee and still believe that a multiracial, multiethnic classification should be included, albeit only together with the multiple checkoffs that have been recommended. However, we believe that the probable intent of this opinion was to explain why they were not recommending a new classification in the directive itself and not a prohibition on its use. Several states and other public bodies have already legislated the use of a multiracial classification. We believe these laws should stand and that prospectively other public bodies be permitted to enact such laws as long as they are amended or enacted to include multiple checkoffs. We disagree that a multiracial, multiethnic classification would, quote, create a new population group. The population group to which they refer already exists and is growing rapidly. We also take issue with the opinion that a multiracial, multiethnic classifier would, quote, add to racial tension, unquote, and, quote, fragment our population, unquote. The essence of the multiracial, multiethnic population is one of racial and ethnic unity. As we have stated before, our community is specially situated to confront racial and inter-ethnic issues precisely because of the special experiences and understanding we acquire in the intimacy of our families and our personalities. Of all populations, ours has the unique potential to become the stable, stable core around which the ethnic pluralism of the United States can in fact be united. We thank the subcommittee for hearing our views. We thank you very much for coming. Our next uh, witness is Harold McDougall, the director of the Washington Bureau of the NAACP. Uh, you have the title of, I think, uh, one of your predecessors is one of the finest people that ever walked Capitol Hill, and that was Clarence Mitchell. And he happened to be one of my three mentors when I came to the Hill in 1960 as a Senate staff person. So you're filling a very honorable office. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm also trying to fill very large shoes. Uh, <clears throat> as you mentioned, he was referred to as the 101st Senator, the Lion of the Lobby. Uh, I am Harold McDougall, uh, the Director of the Washington Bureau of the NAACP, uh, an organization of uh, the nation's oldest and largest civil rights organization, over 600,000 members in the 50 states in the District of Columbia and around the world. Uh, I would like to uh, summarize my testimony, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, and to have it incorporated into the yeah. record. Uh, without objection, all testimony is automatically incorporated the minute I introduce you. Certainly. Just feel free uh, to summarize. And also, I will just do the, make the formality of uh, requesting that my May testimony be incorporated as well. Absolutely. Thank without you. Without objection. Uh, currently, the federal government uses uh, race data for statistical and administrative purposes, including monitoring civil rights compliance person to OMB Directive Number 15. Uh, the data accumulated, um, accumulated under OMB Directive 15 has been used to help enforce the Voting Rights Act, state redistricting plans, 
uh, to, monitor, to, to monitor discrimination in the private sector, uh, establish, evaluate, and monitor affirmative action plans. Uh, as Congressman uh, Conyers indicated, the uh, Home Mortgage Disclosure Act uh, is implicated by census data, Equal Credit Opportunity Act, desegregation plans in the public schools, uh, minority business development programs, the Fair Housing Act, uh, and, and uh, to monitor environmental degradation in communities of color, just to name a few. So this data obviously is very important. Uh, as I think uh, the, um, uh, some of the members in the uh, previous panel indicated, uh, much remains to be done with respect to racial discrimination in this country, and the data, of course, is uh, still very important in that respect. Um, racial, and, uh, racial discrimination is still prevalent, prevalent in American life, and the residual effects of past discrimination continue to limit the advancement of African Americans and other racial minorities. Uh, I did get an opportunity to take a look at Mr. Gingrich's uh, testimony, and one of the things that he said was that um, it would be good if we could just call each other Americans and all this would be behind us. Um, it's as if we could uh, change reality by changing what we call it, or what we call ourselves. Uh, for those who say our society is colorblind, I have to reiterate that saying is not the same thing as doing. Um, if we are to reach the deep roots of the legacy of slavery, involuntary servitude, segregation, segregation, discrimination, and hate violence, we must commit ourselves not merely to undo the words of forced division, but also to undo the consequences of oppressive acts. The census data has been critical in documenting for the American public the deep racial inequalities which still exist in virtually every dimension of American social, economic, and political life. Under these conditions, any, any effort that threatens to complicate, retard, or thwart the collection of this useful data will meet vigorous resistance from the NAACP. I want to say, talk, some, uh, want to talk briefly about the aspirations of individuals with multiple racial heritages. Why don't we at that point uh, have a recess so that you can finish your statement? We're faced with this situation on the floor, that we have one vote now, the 15 minutes will ex be ended in four or five minutes, and I need to get over there to vote. And there will be a series of five-minute votes. So I suggest, and I'm aware of Mrs. Katzen's problems, and we will get you out of here by 1240, but I think we're going to have to be in recess till at least 10 or 12. Thank you, sir. So let's all relax, and we will come back to hear the rest of your testimony. McDougall, please pick up where you left off. Uh, maybe I'll let you catch your breath. Uh, no, Mr. I'm Chairman. in good shape. Okay. Uh, I was uh, just emphasizing that uh, for us, the question of the integrity of data collection over time is of utmost importance in terms of the uh, vigorous enforcement of the civil rights laws. Uh, I also wanted to make uh, some comment about the aspirations of individuals with multiple racial heritages. Um, the NAACP has always supported the right of individual self-determination and self-identification in defining one's racial makeup. For medical reasons and for reasons of possible discrimination against individuals precisely because they are of diverse racial backgrounds, the NAACP supports the, legit the legitimate aspirations of this community for a fair and accurate count of their number. I want to talk a little bit about the interagency committee recommendations of select one or more rather than a separate multiracial category. In Chapter 6, the committee recommended that the method for census respondents to report more than one race should take the form of multi multiple, response, multiple responses to a single question, i.e. select one or more rather than a separate multiracial category. The select one or more option, according to the committee, gives the most accurate picture of changing race, racial and ethnic identification among our citizens without creating discontinuities with historical data collection, uh, such as those associated with a separate multiracial designation. This accords with uh, my earlier testimony in which uh, the NAACP expressed concern that creation of a separate multiracial category might disaggregate the apparent numbers of members of historically protected minority groups, diluting benefits to which they are entitled as a protected class under civil rights laws and under the Constitution itself. 
We know that a small minority of advocates from the community of persons of multiple racial backgrounds continue to advocate for a multiracial category uh, exclusively, uh, apparently because they wish to be considered a new race. The NAACP believes that all people of color, all, uh, all people of color, all facing discrimination and with similar aspirations should wherever possible work together and not in opposition to one another. The proposal by the Interagency Committee to, to, of a select all that apply approach rather than a multiracial category approach facilitates that process. Let me reiterate the NAACP's continued opposition to the collection of data in the first instance in any multiracial category. The Interagency Committee cautions that the use of a separate multiracial category rather than a select one or more approach would create needless confusion. It gives an example of the fact that the states of Georgia, Indiana, and Michigan define multiracial as having parents of different races, whereas California is now considering le legislation which would define multiracial as having parents, grandparents, or great-grandparents of different races. Now, under those definitions, I myself would be black in Georgia, Indiana, and Michigan, but I'd be multiracial in California. See, now I'm getting confused. So I think we have to be very careful about this. Uh, Speaker Gingrich in his testimony indicated that he wanted to avoid the creation of subgroups to further fractionate America. And I would caution then uh, about developing a multiracial group for that very reason. I guess in that respect, the, the speaker and I agree. We must take care not to recreate, reinforce, or even expand the caste system we are all trying so hard to overcome. The NAACP, the NAACP believes that most individuals of diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds do not think of themselves as a new race, but instead wish to celebrate all their heritages, rather than blend them into a new category reminiscent of the colored category of South Africa's very sad history of apartheid. For those who treasure each and every forebearer, a check one or more option should suffice. I want to talk a little bit about the methods of data tabulation um, uh, and get past the cultural questions. The, re the remaining question now is, is not the collection of data. The select one or more option that ha uh, of the interagency committee has admirably split the Gordian knot that separated many of the traditional civil rights organizations from the emerging multi-ethnic and multiracial groups. As people of color, we greatly appreciate that. Now the question moves further down the pipeline of the data process to the point of tabulation. What is needed now are protocols to modify existing tabulation procedures to accommodate census responses reporting more than one race. Our concern, obviously, is that such protocols maintain the integrity of civil rights enforcement. In addition, we must bear in mind that multiple race respondents might encounter discrimination as people of mixed race, as people visually identified with one or more of the single race categories, either or both. Under those circumstances, we believe, we believe it is important to be able to count all the acts of discrimination that an individual might face. The interagency, the interagency report identified three possible tabulation methods. There are some others, somewhat more esoteric, that we're not even, we don't, we're not, we don't find any of them satisfactory. I think my colleague, Dr. Waters from Harvard, will go more deeply into those. But the three that we found most interesting were presented by the um, interagency report as bridges between existing classification systems and those to be developed. And they are the single race approach, the all-inclusive approach, and a historical series approach. The single race approach approximates the use of a multiracial category. It involves assigning single race responses to a single race category and multiple race responses to a multiple race category. Now, how the responses to the multiple race category would be then disaggregated and reaggregated. Re aggregated We don't have any guidance, and obviously that's something we'd be very interested in finding out about. The all-inclusive approach, uh, obviously, we like. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Congressman Conyers indicated that uh, uh, adding up to more than 100 percent of a person is a problem for capitation, not for the ability to track instances of, di instances of discrimination. Um, the all-inclusive approach involves assigning all those who check more than one race into every category that they check off. Tiger Woods, as Cablin Asian, he calls himself, Caucasian, Black, Native American, and Asian, would be counted four times. Now, you know, I, I think a lot of us would like to see four tigers out there. <clears throat> Each community of his, of his diverse heritage would have the opportunity to, to claim him without an unseemly parent's battle to be resolved Solomon-like by offering to cut him into quarters. 
Each community would also have the ability to protect him from each act of institutional or, or uh, individual discrimination he might face, whether as a member of a single race group or as a mixed race individual. As the committee notes, this would result in percentages for each of the four separate racial categories exceeding 100% because multiple race responses would be counted in each reported racial category. Still, the report continues the all-inclusive approach would provide information on the total number of times the racial category had been elected. It would also enable organizations like the NAACP to record all the number of times that an individual might face different kinds of discrimination. So we obviously favor that approach. We wish to know each time such discrimination occurs, for whatever reason. The third approach, the historical series approach, seeks to fine tune the tabulation so that multiple race respondents are assigned to single race categories from the outset based on the likelihood that persons who check off at least one of the historically protected categories, black, Asian, or Pacific Islander, and Native American, will encounter discrimination. This approach meets many of the goals of the all-inclusive approach in keeping track of likely acts of discrimination, while also meeting many of the objectives of the single race approach in keeping the capitation or head count at no more than 100% of the population. The only problem area, and it may be a small one, exists with regard to multiple race respondents who check off more than one protected category. Tiger Woods, again, is our example. Tiger would not be assigned to white because he also checked off a protected category. He would not be assigned to Asian, black, or Native American because he could be claimed by all three, driving the capitation rate in each single race category over 100%. Instead, he would stay in a multiracial category, and this obviously needs to be examined uh, further. In conclusion, we can say that it may be that the single race, the all-inclusive, and the historical series approaches, singly or in combination, might be used by different agencies for different purposes, the kind of aggregation and disaggregation and exercises that Congressman Sawyer referred to earlier in the day. What is important for our purposes is that evidence of every act of discrimination be preserved. What would be important from the standpoint of the Census Bureau and the federal agencies, and obviously congressmen concerned about the size of their districts, uh, is that protocols be adopted that would enable the different agencies and the different formulas to talk to one another and share data in a meaningful way. As a general matter, we favor the all-inclusive approach and would not favor the single race approach, and the historical series approach appears to us to be a compromise. All in all, we appreciate the spirit of compromise and creativity the Interagency Committee has shown and look forward to a successful resolution of the remaining questions. Surely, this is a matter we would all like to get past and through so that we can focus on issues of fair and accurate methods of assuring that the entire population is actually counted. In this regard, on the issue of statistical sampling, which was mentioned earlier in the day, is key. Such modern methods of ensuring an accurate count are necessary in our ever-changing society. Just as we have been inno innovative in resolving the issue of how our citizens identify themselves, so too we hope for innovation ensuring that all our citizens are fairly counted, especially minorities and the poor. I thank you for your time and for receiving my testimony. Well, we thank you. We're going to adjust panels. I had planned that Dr. Waters would sit with both panels, so if we can get some extra chairs in there, I'm going to have Ms. Katzen first because I'm conscious of her time commitment. And uh, let's just, if the staff will move some extra chairs in there, we're going to keep this panel, we're going to add to it the administration panel, and uh, we're going to get to a dialogue once we get through the testimony and the formal statement each one wants to make. And uh, as I say, Dr. Waters, uh, we'll, you're not going to forget you, and you're going to help bring peace and harmony here. They're welcome to. That's what I said. Uh, the other gov all government witnesses can come forward, and uh, we'll just integrate you. So we've got Sally Katzen, the administrative administrator of the Office of Information Regulatory Affairs and the Office of Management and Budget. We have Isabel Katz Pinsler, acting assistant attorney general for civil rights, Department of Justice, and Nancy Gordon, associate director for demographic programs, Bureau of the Census. Oh, right. All who are going to be testifying include staff backing you up. If you turn, for instance, to Ms. Wallman, I want them all taking the oath. So if you'll all stand, stand. all staff that are going to be testifying sometime in the course of it. <laughs> uh, in the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee, you affirm and swear that it's the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. 
All witnesses have affirmed, including staff. The clerk will note that. Uh, uh, Dr. Katz and I'm aware that you have a tight time schedule, and uh, you have appeared here many times, and uh, you and I have talked uh, privately on this, but let's get it on the record as to where we are, how we got there. I think the basic question that everyone has asked, both members of this panel as well as congressional members, and Ms. Meek uh, mentions it in her testimony, which I put in the record. She couldn't make it this morning. And that is, how are we going to realistically use those data in, to help us in civil rights enforcement, in benefits received, so forth? So I'm assuming that you will get into some of this. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate your inviting me here today. Uh, as in the past, I want to commend you for your leadership in this area and the series of hearings that you are holding, I think, are very beneficial. I found sitting here and listening to the testimony that preceded me to be very uh, useful and informative, and I appreciate the opportunity to add uh, a little bit of background and perhaps a little bit of prognosis uh, of where we're going from here uh, to the discussion that we've had so far. Uh, as you will recall, the last time I testified was on April 23rd, uh, and at that point I gave you a detailed uh, uh, report of how we had gotten to the point we had, but we had not yet then received the results of the last of a series of tests and research that were a very important part of our work. Our work was a two parallel track study, one of public comment and public suggestions, and one of research and testing. And we received the results of the last research in May. And then I received from the interagency committee their recommendations and report, which we made available to the public in a Federal Register notice on July 9th of this year, requesting comments for a 60-day period. What you have heard this morning underscores some of the salient facts. First, that it is the report of the interagency committee that consists of 30 federal agencies that use or generate data. Second, the recommendations were unanimous. There was not a single dissent or separate concurrence, which is somewhat unusual uh, when you gather 50 federal agencies together on any issue of policy. Uh, third, we've had a lot of discussion this morning uh, about the recommendations. And with the exception of Congressman Sawyer, who mentioned um, one or two of the others, we've been focusing on what would be determined would apply for housing assistance applications, for school registrations, uh, for medical research. It is not just the census, although that has been the sole uh, issue that has been discussed to date. I also would like to mention, in light of some of the comments that I heard this morning, that um, this is the recommendation of the interagency committee. OMB has asked for public opinion on it. What I am saying now will be drawn from the report and recommendations. Ultimately, at the conclusion of the public comment period, I will be making a decision with respect to changes, if any, in the existing standards. And I am uh, assuring myself that I will keep an open mind and listen to all comments. And therefore, if I'm making a statement, it is drawn from the report that we have received rather than representing my own or OMB's views of this. Our views will be made known in October. I think, however, one comment that would be appropriate is to perhaps um, respond to the comment that was made that this is a compromise uh, or that it was seeking to appease one group or another. Uh, my view is that this is the effort of professional statisticians wrestling with, and I think that is the appro appropriate verb to use, wrestling with a very difficult statistical policy issue and that they were addressing it as professional statisticians. I indeed, over the four-year period, we have had very little comment and certainly very little negative comment about the process that we've used to keep this uh, on that basis. And that the objective was not to read the tea leaves or f figure out what might be politically uh, attractive solution 
uh, but actually to try to come up with the best policy for the government for statistical purposes. And therefore, rather than viewing this as a compromise, uh, I believe they believe it is a principled accommodation of the legitimate interests that have been presented. Uh, I also would note in this connection that we've heard some talk about um, how long it has taken. I believe actually that's a sign of the seriousness of purpose that was addressed to this. It has been four years. There has been a comprehensive review, which is what I committed to in a congressional hearing when we started this. Um, there was also some question in terms of the timing. Uh, the recommendation of the Interagency Committee is that all federal agencies imp um, implement whatever changes are adopted no later than 2003. Uh, in answer to Mr. Fernandez, yes, some can implement them sooner. The 2003 was used because it will any changes will be reflected in the decennial census, and the results of the decennial census will not be available until the early part of the next millennium. And since they provide the denominator for many of the programmatic offices, it may be in, uh, inappropriate for some of the federal agencies to use the revised forms before then. But it is an outside date, um, not a um, necessarily end date. Um, I guess the other comment I would make as a general comment is that we um, heard this morning a number of comments about the good work that was done. And I want to emphasize that whatever kudos were given or compliments stated belong to the Interagency Committee, which is a group of uh, professional statisticians from the Civil Service under the leadership of Clyde Tucker, who is in the audience from BLS, and under the supervision of Catherine Wallman, who is the chief statistician and head of my statistical policy branch. Whatever good has been done, it is to their credit uh, and, and not to, to mine or to OMBs generally. Uh, this is their effort and their work. And I've been, in some instances, a spokesperson on this issue, but they deserve whatever credit is received on this. Now, you've heard a lot about the actual recommendations, and I think it probably is not very useful to go through them except to underscore a few points that may clarify uh, what many of the uh, previous witnesses have been talking about. Uh, you have heard that there should not be a separate racial category called multiracial, a box to be checked off called multiracial. Uh, it is one of the findings, again, from the interagency report is that the term multiracial frequently was misunderstood by respondents to mean not only persons of mixed race using the four general categories of race that we have previously identified, but also to be multi-ethnic. Irish Americans or um, someone with a parent who is Irish American and a parent who is Italian American uh, identified themselves as multiracial, as did persons who had a Jewish parent and a non-Jewish parent because they saw Judaism as not only a religion but a race. There were a number of different variations in the testing that showed that the term multiracial had a variety of meanings. The other finding of the interagency committee was that multiracial standing alone was not particularly informative since even if it were limited to combinations of the four categories that are already provided for, it would be unclear from simply checking a box multiracial whether the person was had a, had a parent or, or heritage that was both black and white, or whether it was American Indian and um, uh, Asian American, or uh, black and Asian American, or one of the other combinations. So standing alone, it was not particularly informative, and there was a call this morning for accuracy and clarity, and the finding of the committee was that a multiracial box standing alone did not provide that. On the other hand, the committee was very clear that individuals should be able to check one or more of the historical categories. And this, I think, reflected the interagency committee's belief that, as you, Mr. Chairman, pointed out in your opening statement, this is a deeply personal 
individual issue. And on self-identification, persons should be able to celebrate their entire heritage and not be forced to choose. As a matter of uh, principle, this was very important to the interagency committee. Also, one of the recommendations of the committee that has gotten the most attention this morning is how these data will be reported. And I think there is unanimity of opinion that that is the te most telling point. Our goal is accuracy. Our goal is clarity. And so the recommendation of the interagency committee is that when the data are reported, a minimum of one additional racial category designated more than one race would be included so long as the criteria for data quality and confidentiality are met. We also envision appreciable more data, appreciably more data being available. Uh, in response to the questions that have been raised, I don't have answers, uh, but I am aware of the importance of providing as much data as possible. I, I've said that I'm from the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. Information is my first name, and I believe that we should have robust information uh, that provides the kind of information that would be used in different circumstances. Remember, this applies to a variety of different types of forms. And therefore, in, any different, uh, in many different circumstances, different presentations of the data can be more informative than others. We are in the process, even as we speak, of compiling a group of experts drawn from those who worked on the interagency committee and doing the research to begin to put together <coughs> recommendations for the tabulation. Our mandate or our charge to this group is to provide as much information as possible in as many different ways as possible, <coughs> excuse me, so that we'll have this information available uh, for the purposes that we might like. Thank you very much. And that we need it to be done in a way, as Congressman Sawyer said, that is rational and consistent with historical data so that we do not lose the data that we have over the last 20 years. This is a not insignificant issue. And I am not at all surprised by people who say, but you don't have all the answers yet, and yet you want us to comment on your proposal. We need more information. The reason for our proceeding as we have is because of the tremendous interest that was generated in the underlying reports. And until the final research was concluded in May, we were not in a position to receive the base recommendations. But as those were being formulated, as I say, we are putting together a group to do the follow-on work and present recommendations and guidance for the reporting and tabulating of this uh, information. Because the time is short, I, I will just identify other areas that are important for those who are interested in this issue. In addition to the multiracial question, there is the uh, set of issues surrounding the request for information on ethnicity, Hispanic origin, not of Hispanic origin. And the sequencing of that question with the racial questions, whether it should be combined, whether it should be separate, and whether it should precede or follow. We have, um, again, interagency recommendations on that that are supported by the findings uh, that should produce more complete data, both on Hispanics and of non-Hispanics, that would be very useful. There's another area of the report that deals with uh, whether additional categories, apart from a multiracial category, should be included. We heard from Middle Easterners, Arabs, Cape Verdeans, European Americans, German Americans, Creoles, all asking that they have a box identifying them. The interagency committee's recommendation was that there should be no racial or ethnic categories added to the minimum standards, and I stress minimum because in the long form on the census, we have a lot of national origin type questions. In other kinds of surveys, you can always ask additional classifications so long as they can be re-aggregated to the major categories. But if you set 
a minimum standard and you include additional boxes, if you will, then those additional boxes would have to appear on each and every federal form. And we have found that there is um, uh, a variety of the size and the geographic concentration of several of these populations would mean that the inclusion of these in all of the forms would yield very little data. That's not to say they can't be included where they're needed or necessary. There also was a lot of discussion um, in the hearings that we had and is reflected in the report on where Native Hawaiians should be included. And I've had already one briefing with members of the Hawaiian congressional delegation uh, on this particular issue. Um, there were also questions about terminology that were raised. And what I'm trying to do here is simply reflect that while the attention has been on the multiracial issue, this report goes well beyond that. This report speaks to a much broader base and covers a lot of other issues. And again, I would encourage those who are interested to, to get the whole report and read the whole report. And then comment. We are in the middle of a comment period. We want to hear what the American public think about what has been recommended to OMB. There is a set of general principles that has guided this review. They may well serve as a very good base for people to comment to see if we have met our principles. We think it is very important that what we end up with is something that the American people understand and appreciate and accept because then we will have greater responsiveness and even more accurate data for our purposes. And so I cannot overemphasize how important the public comment period is. I'm sorry I've run over my time, but I wanted to respond to some of the issues that have been raised uh, this morning, and I thank you again for your leadership in this area. Let me uh, begin the questioning. Each member will have five minutes. We'll go a second round if we can, and then we'll get to the other witnesses. But I know you have to leave. Uh, let's just get a few facts straight. Uh, when you mentioned the national origin question, that's on the long form, form only. Yes. And uh, how many people get the long form? What percent of the American One -sixth. citizenry? One sixth. One sixth get the long form. Is that national origin based on where they came from or where their parents and grandparents came from? Nancy? Uh, the question is left for the um, respondent to answer. It, it follows the same principle of self-identification, so it's the person's desire to express whatever national origin he or she identifies with. Has the Census Bureau, which you represent, ever followed up to see just how accurate that is with an interview to know how people are interpreting it and is, are the data of any use based on that variety of self-identification? There was a um, small re-interview program for the 1990 census, and I could get you the results of that for the record. Do you remember offhand just the general conclusion? I'm sorry, I'm not okay. familiar with that. Without it. objection, I'll go with the record at this point. Now I'm interested in who will make the decision, the president, the director of OMB, or Administrator Katzen, after you summarize all the Federal Register comments. That's the hierarchy, isn't it? That is Clinton, the hierarchy. Clinton, Reigns, and Katz. The vice president's in there as well. There are few. He, doesn't, he is not in the hierarchy. Sorry, he's a legislative official. Presidents can give him assignments, but there is no constitutional assignment for him. Uh, the director of ONB has asked me to supervise this process. On an issue of this, I fully expect to keep him well informed of uh, my thought processes when we reach that stage. And, and I believe, actually, that this will be reflected in an OMB directive, which would then be uh, signed by the director uh, of OMB. Very good. Now, the, the real question everybody's sort of asking is, how do we avoid double counting? What's your view on that? Uh, my view on that is that where we provide different cuts of the information, we can use the information in a way that assures the most precise measure for the purposes needed. In some instances, um, 
one can provide, as we recommend here, at least one alternative that adds to 100, so there is no double counting. In other instances, uh, I wouldn't call it double counting. If one were interested in finding out, for example, the aggregate number of persons in this country who view themselves as Asian Americans, it would be fair, I believe, to include all of those who check Asian American and only Asian American, plus those who check Asian American and one other or two others or three others, because that person is saying they view themselves in whole or in part as Asian American. If one is looking for a number, that is one way of presenting it. Now, it is true if you were to add up all the people who check all the boxes, but we're not, we don't need to get there. And so, depending upon the purposes for which the information is being used, you may have different cuts of the same data. One of the attractive features that we have heard, or that I have heard spoken of about the interagency committee's recommendations, it provides those different cuts so that the most appropriate cut would be used, tabulation would be used for the purposes uh, needed. Okay. On my time, Dr. Waters, since you're our expert witness on both panels, uh, is there a question you would like to ask Ms. Katzen before she leaves, based on your own research? Um, I don't think so. I think her, her testimony covered it. Very good. Any other of the members of panel three that would like to ask Ms. Katzen a question while she's here? Okay. You, who's, who hasn't? Mr. Fernandez. Yeah, though, pull a chair up here, Mr. Fernandez. We're going to lose track of you. Just grab one of those chairs. This is, we can do what we want with this room. We want our witnesses happy. Yeah, I am, All right. I am interested in uh, the, the handling of the so-called ethnic question or, in, in essence, we're really discussing the Hispanic population. And in particular, with reference to those individuals who are both Hispanic and non-Hispanic. <clears throat> now, in the census, the question appears as, uh, as a separate question, and it asks you to indicate whether you are Hispanic or non-Hispanic, in which instance I would answer both questions. I would answer yes and no. And there are a growing number of individuals who could do that, and who could also give a multiple response in the race question. Many Mexicans are of Native American and Spanish or European ancestry, and many Puerto Ricans are part African and part European as well, and understand this. What is not clear from the recommendations is the concentration on the racial categories in the discussion of the new permissiveness as far as the multiple checkoffs is concerned. I'm not sure that that was intended, but maybe it was. And what I'm asking is for some clarity as to what, how you're going to handle that. Well, I, I think that's a very good question. I, I think the interagency committee took some steps towards uh, providing information on that, but has not provided answers to all of your questions. One of the steps that they um, had talked about was that where there is self-identification, there would be uh, two separate questions where there is um, not self-identification, as in, for example, uh, death certificates or emergency rooms where a person is not able to self-identify, that you could have a combined and then check all uh, that may be appropriate, for example. Uh, there also was a, 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 some significant discussion that would ensure that regardless of how one responded on the ethnic question had full opportunity to choose among all of the different racial questions as well. But those are, I think, several steps towards an answer to your question. It is not a complete answer, and this is one of the issues that we would be very interested in receiving additional uh, consultation and help as we go through the public I will be period. happy to provide that. Uh, I, there was one other aspect of that that I raised in my testimony and in other venues, and that relates to the ultimate appearance of the new OMB 15. The current OMB 15, as I understand it, is two interchangeable formats. In other words, you're supposed to be able, 
uh, to, to integrate the two formats when you get the numbers together. And in one of them, the Hispanic category is treated as a race, and in the other, it's treated as a so-called ethnic group. If that problem is not resolved regarding the uh, multiple checkoffs applying or not applying to the Hispanic group, and the two formats are re in, uh, interchangeable formats are retained, I think you're going to have a serious dilemma. I, I think on the latter point, the recommendation of the interagency committee would be that where there is self-identification to have two separate questions with the ethnic question preceding the racial question. It would be only in the instance where self-identification is not possible that you would use a combined. So they wouldn't be interchangeable form, uh, formats. They would be alternative formats depending on whether it was self-identification or third-party identification. But again, um, this is the report and the recommendations, and this is another area in which if there are issues that we have not anticipated or if there are unintended consequences of some of the recommendations that have not yet been fully discussed, the purpose of the public comment period is to bring those to our attention. We very much would like to work with, with your group and other groups in answering those questions. Our objective is to enhance the accuracy and the utility of this information, not to confuse or um, um, complicate uh, the issue. So I, I, we appreciate your assistance. We, we thank you and now yield five minutes to Ms. Maloney, the ranking Democrat. I'm, I'm sorry we're going to have to because of the timing, but we'll try to get it in. Uh, th thank you. Uh, Ms. Katzen, uh, we've heard from a, a number of, of uh, witnesses that while the interagency uh, recommenda recommendations are indeed a, a step in the right direction, the problem of how this data will be used uh, remains a, a major obstacle. It's my understanding that it'll be sometime in 1999 before that guidance uh, will be offered. And that concerns me for two reasons. Uh, first, it seems to be uh, premature to change the way the information is collected prior to determining how it's going to be used. And secondly, it means another two years of uncertainty for those who rely on this data for enforcement purposes uh, and uh, for discrimination cases and so forth, and, and what can be done to shorten this time frame. We, too, were concerned about proceeding with a recommendation without having answered the follow-up questions of the reporting and tabulation and have ourselves chosen to accelerate that time frame uh, appreciably. Uh, we, have al we are already in the process of putting together the committee, and I have asked uh, the chair of the committee to please do absolutely everything humanly possible to have preliminary um, recommendations for the reporting and tabulating guidance by October of this year when we have to reach our final decisions. Um, I got a, a sort of shame. stony, stony cold, okay, we'll do what we can. But I think it is important, and I'm going to put as much emphasis on that as possible because those questions need answers. Do we have any, any guidance from the courts uh, regarding how they would evaluate statistics and discrimination cases, which include people who claim mixed ancestry? I would prefer to defer this to our um, uh, witness from the Justice Department who may know of past cases. I would hope that for the future, we would be able to present to the court compelling reasons to look at the various ways in which we are tabulating this information and the justification for using the best information available. Yeah, if, if you like, I can, I can respond to that question. There is no case law specifically on that point, um, but I would, I would echo what Ms. Katzen said, um, that we would use, you know, we would obviously try to frame arguments to, uh, to use this data in the, in the best way possible for our enforcement mechanisms. As, as you know, we have certain uh, protected categories uh, for civil rights and voting rights. And my question is, how would uh, those persons who check mixed an ancestry be treated? Would they be treated as a protected status? You know, just to come down to a specific example, uh, under your proposed uh, guidelines from the Interagency Committee, how would you count a person who is half black and half Asian? 
uh, for the purpose of litigating, uh, uh, you know, employment discrimination cases, for example, and other discrimination cases, for example. Would that be a protected uh, category? Uh, again, I think that that's part of the information uh, that has to be developed on, on how it's going to be tabulated, but um, I, I would think that it would depend, frankly, on the particular uh, uh, kind of case, the facts of a particular case you were trying to develop, um, assuming that you had the, the, uh, the data available that, you know, a certain number of people had, were in both categories. It would depend on on the, you know, the region of the country, uh, whether it was in a, you know, a, a significant enough uh, number of people who fell into that category to even register on the published uh, on the published data. L let me just say that that we are accustomed to doing uh, we, this. This uh, well, never mind. I'll, I'll wait. <laughs> I, I would add, I would add that in terms of protections that have been afforded um, based on past discrimination, uh, a person would not lose. A person should not lose um, equal opportunity. Uh, because uh, they are a member of two different minority groups that have been discriminated against in different ways at different times. And as I illustrated earlier in the, the different ways of tabulating the information, it seems to me that for purposes of determining whether there has been uh, discrimination against Asian Americans, one would look to see the number of Asian Americans who view themselves wholly as Asian Americans and therefore checked only one box, but also include those who checked Asian American along with whatever other categories they saw because they do see themselves mm -hmm. as um, Asian American as part of their heritage, which they want to celebrate and to, and to defend. Well, to, to simplify the, the question, for the, for the purpose of, of litigating discrimination cases, uh, would you, um, is the option to check several racial categories more useful than a general multiracial category? Absolutely, because it tells you which categories they are in, and you would have much better, more precise information, and therefore I believe that you will have um, a more accurate picture, again, based on the findings and the recommendations that the Interagency Committee has presented and still waiting to hear the public comment. Well, well, under the proposed uh, changes, how would you count a person who indicated a black and white racial heritage for the purpose of evaluating the impact on minority voting uh, dilution under Voting Rights Act? I would, for purposes of determining that if they saw themselves as black and black as a group that is under these they circumstances would be protected. protected, they are protected. Mm -hmm. They're not less protected because they also claim um, white heritage. Now, um, just to clarify, who will be tabulating how this will be determined? Will your interagency task force do this, or who will be? These would, these would be guidelines for how the federal agencies and programs that have programmatic responsibilities for the particular areas okay, are so to treat the data so that I would look to the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department, the Equal Opportunity Employment, Commission, so, others. So each, it, it, just to clarify, each agency then uh, will be allowed to determine how to tabulate the data for civil rights programs. Is that correct? Subject to the overall guidance that will presumably be set to use the most accurate data for the purposes selected, but it is the federal agency that will better understand the particular purposes. Uh, but if we, we go back to the agencies, won't we be going back to the same chaos that we had before we had Directive 15 with each agency determining? And then no, didn't no, Directive no. 15 come out to clarify? Well, in that instance, they were using different definitions oh, I see. for the different categories, and so we wanted have comparability of data. But each agency will tabulate. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Five minutes to the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, for questioning. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Katzen, you indicated that you felt that the Interagency Task Force had done an outstanding job, and I certainly share that, and I think from what we've heard, there are many others who also share that position. Do you feel that professionally 
they answered the main question, seemingly, that individuals have raised in terms of the ability to identify in a concrete way with their racial roots? Yes, sir, I do. If that be the case, in terms of the additional information that would be generated as a result of the ability to, to, to generate that information, do you see any other useful, I mean, what, what other purposes perhaps could one suggest that information would be useful for? One of the um, questions that the interagency committee struggled with initially was whether the number of persons who would choose a multiracial uh, box if there were an opportunity to do so was uh, large uh, enough to acknowledge and was growing. And I think what we might see if this recommendation were accepted uh, would enable us to, to better track the increase in immigration and in interracial marriages that are occurring. And some speak of the melting pot. We will now have, I think, better information. That's one form of information that may come from a mark one or more approach that is the essence of this. As to other types of use of this information, I would defer to uh, the experts in um, the social sciences uh, who may foresee other um, uses, but our attempt has been to, again, reflect as accurately as possible the demographics of this country and not create new categories or new protections or, 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 or new areas in that regard. Did I understand you to say or suggest or indicate that in your mind, protected categories that already exist in all probability would not lose their protection even though they may secondarily, or even not secondarily, even though they, they may designate that they are part of another race. That would be my view as I look at the materials that are being generated, and I'm reflecting here what I believe to be the view of the interagency committee that sought to enhance the accuracy without diluting in any way the valid information that we have in the past and without affecting in any way the protections that Congress has already decided. You know, I, I would suggest if, if, you know, ultimately that was the case and we had the, the, the acceptance of the task force's recommendation in terms of the ultimate, then those individuals would maintain their protection. Other individuals will have had an opportunity to be accurately depicted in terms of their sense of being. And I think that this task force would have just done the American people a tremendous service. And, and I mean, that's a position that I hold. I just have one other question, and that is to you. Has there been much conversation about providing instructions for people in such a way that it would perhaps decrease the likelihood of their making error because they just didn't quite understand what was being asked for? Yes, and one of the tasks of this uh, committee that we're using, we're pulling together now to work on the tabulation and reporting is to include um, training and ins actually the wording of the instructions on the forms themselves as well as the training of those who would be administering them. And this is, again, another effort that would be government-wide to enhance the accuracy of the information. I thank you very much. And I'd like to ask Ms. Graham 
Ms. Graham, do, do, from listening to the dialogue today, uh, do you feel that the interagency task force's recommendation takes care of some of the concerns that you have expressed? It does take care of some of the concerns. Uh, as I said in my testimony, it's, it's as if we got <coughs> half a loaf. Um, it takes care of, of children like mine having the ability to check more than one so that they don't have to choose to, to be the race of one of their parents or deny actually the race of one of their parents. But it still does not give them the ability to have a, a sanctioned uh, category called multiracial or even a, a sanctioned name called multiracial. It's very interesting that uh, the day after the interagency recommendation came out, uh, the media started to say mixed race again. Up until that point, they were using multiracial. And then uh, the recommendation was no multiracial category, and it reverted back to, to mixed race and, and some other things. But, but the word multiracial was suddenly gone. And that's what we are fighting to keep. You were here when uh, Representative Owens made a comment this morning relative to the creation of new races in some instances. Mm -hmm. Did that bother you any in terms of the possibility of not just the designation, but actually the creation of a new racial group? That bothers me as well, and that is not what we are trying to do at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, our, our recommendation has always been to have a, a multiracial identifier with check all that apply underneath that. So actually, we're, you know, we're, we're talking about the same thing and not creating a new racial category. And so I guess we're, the, we're agreed. And I think the only concern would be that oftentimes intent is not the same thing as result. I'm, I'm saying oftentimes we intend one set of things, but sometimes something other than what we were seeking ends up being the result. I thank you very much, and I, I have no further questions. And we have to go vote. And we've got to go vote. I'm conscious that we I'm conscious that we have to vote here, and I'm conscious that the Assistant Attorney General also needs to be somewhere else, and I do want to hear her testimony. Uh, and let me ask my colleagues: if we recessed until two o'clock, uh, would that uh, be convenient to you? Would you be here, or are you on airplanes? Would that solve the Assistant Attorney General's problem if we could recess till two o'clock? Well, I'm already We've my, got my two one o'clock appointment is uh, <laughs> yeah. with the Attorney General is already I'm, I'm late. I, I, that'll be fine. All right. If, if we can, uh, let me just uh, end this session with before Ms. Katzen leaves. We appreciate very much your testimony. We know we've detained you here. Mr. McDougall did have a question, and I'd like him to be able to ask it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I was just uh, interested in uh, Ms. Katzen's um, description of some of the instances in which self-identification would not be possible. For example, death certificates and um, uh, emergency room certificates. Uh, I wondered if Ms. Katzen, if you could identify for us if there were any other circumstances in which self-identification would not be appropriate or possible. I'm not aware of any offhand. Again, this was something that would depend largely upon how the federal forms are being used in, in different circumstances. One of our very important principles was self-identification, but we have to recognize that there are certain circumstances where it simply is not possible to rely upon the individual to respond. Well, we thank you, and we're in recess until 2.05 p.m. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let's <clears throat>
subcommittee will resume. We thank you for your patience today. We had an unusual series of votes on the floor, and I know it uh, wrecked everybody's schedule, but that's democracy in action. And since this is democracy in action, when we work in committee, we're glad we could have our key witnesses back. And uh, Assistant Attorney General Pinsler, I'm going to start with you, and then Mrs. Uh, Gordon, and then uh, Dr. Waters, uh, since I'm using you as an expert on two panels. And please all stay there, and we can have a dialogue and solve some problems, perhaps. So uh, as you know, we put your statements immediately in the record. And uh, you can summarize them, or generally we'd like you to do it in five or so minutes so we can have time for questions. And I know you've got a busy day anyhow. So, General Pinsler, if you'll start, why uh, uh, we'll Mr. begin. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the subcommittee, I'm pleased to join my colleagues on this panel. Uh, the Department of Justice um, participated in the interagency committee and commend its efforts to address this difficult issue. Uh, we believe that the country will be well served by the changes recommended by the interagency uh, committee because if adopted they will address the concerns of those members of the public who find the existing standard does not allow them comfortably to report their identities while at the same time allowing the federal government to continue to collect accurate and reliable data thus enhancing the effectiveness um, of the enforcement of the civil rights laws. Uh, it will be necessary to evaluate these newly collected data so that their use is consistent with historical precedent. This will ensure that the information presented is presented in a fashion that is reliable and useful to agencies and organizations such as the Department of Justice that have law enforcement responsibilities. Um, since my uh, administration colleagues have already presented the recommendations of the interagency committee and the work that is ongoing, uh, I thought it would be helpful to tell you how the Department of Justice relies on racial and ethnic data to carry out its law enforcement mission. Uh, the Civil Rights Division, of course, uh, of the Department enforces the civil rights laws uh, that were enacted by Congress to uh, combat historical and continuing discrimination against racial and ethnic minorities, among others. Uh, the evidence of discrimination that served as a basis for enacting those laws has been compelling, as reflected in legislative history, and led to overwhelming support that these laws garnered when enacted. The division relies extensively on demographic data in the course of our efforts to identify and remedy violations of the civil rights laws for which we have enforcement responsibility, including the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Fair Housing Act of 1968, and the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. Our law enforcement efforts depend heavily on demographic data that are accepted by the courts as reliable and presented in a usable format. They also depend on data that allow individuals to identify themselves as members of groups that are subjected to discrimination on the basis of race or ethnicity. Um, I would like to just briefly outline some, not all, uh, of the ways that the division relies on race and ethnicity data in our law enforcement work. Um, obviously, I can't be exhaustive in, in the time allowed. Um, we need accurate data for purposes of enforcing the Fair Housing Act and the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, both of which prohibit discrimination on the basis of race and national origin. The data assists in a variety of ways in determining whether a housing or lending practice is unlawful. For example, having accurate information about the racial composition of neighborhoods is critical in determining whether a real estate company is steering minority home seekers away from white neighborhoods. Racial and ethnic census data are particularly useful in our efforts to ensure that lenders do not discriminate in making home mortgages and other types of loans. This helps in determining, for example, whether a lender is designating its geographical service areas, has a, whether a, a lender designating its geographical service areas has excluded areas where large concentrations of racial minorities live. Race and ethnic census data also assist in analyzing marketing practices. For example, lend, for example, we consider whether a lender used methods such as direct mail solicitation in select areas that avoid minority borrowers or, on the other hand, targeted minority borrowers for predatory lending practices such as very high-priced mortgages. Our fair housing and lending cases require complex statistical analysis usually designed to determine the extent to which racial and ethnic differences in mortgage prices or the denial rates have a 
uh, could have occurred by chance. Here we control for various combinations of racial, ethnic, and economic data to assess their possible impact on the price or denial of rate, uh, rate differentials. Accurate identification of race and ethnicity of borrowers is critical to such analyses. Uh, accurate data plays, play an essential role uh, um, in our enforcement of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. Uh, as, uh, as you may know, we, inf we, uh, we enforce as to state and local uh, governments, um, and, uh, and Title VII prohibits employment discrimination. Um, the race and ethnic data are essential to establish a prima facie case that an employer has engaged in an employment practice either intent that has either intentionally disadvantaged individuals or has had an illegal discriminatory impact on the basis of race or national origin. In general, a statistical prima facie case depends on comparison of, for example, the racial and ethnic uh, composition of a relevant labor pool uh, as compared to the racial and ethnic composition of those hired for a particular position. The absence of accurate aggregated race and ethnic data can be used um, to, to determine, excuse me, the absence of ac accurate aggregated race and ethnic data that can be used to determine the impact of an employment practice would hurt the department's ability to pursue uh, cases of illegal uh, employment discrimination. Uh, in the area of voting rights, uh, these data are particularly important for the enforcement of Section 5 of the Act, uh, which requires covered uh, districts to obtain preclearance uh, of proposed changes in election practices to ensure that they do not have the purpose or effect of disadvantaging minority voters on the basis of race or ethnicity. Under Section 5, census data provide uh, decisive information in cases when it is alleged uh, that, the, uh, that the proposed election rules will have differential impact. Uh, enforcement of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act requires, also requires uh, accurate data, uh, especially when courts must determine whether a state, county, or local redistricting plan has the effect of diluting minority voting strength. Uh, these data are also crucial to demonstrating polarized racial block voting patterns, which the Supreme Court has found to be an important, of importance in proving a violation of Section 2. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would like to, to, uh, to briefly address the issue of uh, the multiracial category versus the one or more races debate. Uh, the division has been concerned that the, that the inclusion of additional categories such as multiracial or other or uh, open-ended response would fragment the racial and, and ethnic group data and make enforcement more difficult because the additional categories would confuse respondents, lead to less reliable data, and make it difficult to prove that members of particular racial or ethnic group are suffering discrimination. The research conducted by the Interagency Committee bore out our concerns. The committee concluded that the best means of measuring the growing multiracial population uh, and continuing on, uh, for an accurate census and to collect re reliable demographic data would be to choose as appropriate the one or more races rather than the single multiracial category, and we agree. Uh, in addition, further work uh, is needed, as has been pointed out, uh, to ensure that these data will be used so as not to have adverse impact, in particular on, on small, uh, uh, relatively small groups with relatively high intermarriage rates, uh, such as Asian Pacific Islanders, Native Americans, Alaskan Natives. Uh, and as indicated that that, that uh, uh, research, uh, as indicated by the research conducted by the Interagency Committee. Uh, federal statistical agencies who are members of the Interagency Committee will continue to look at how the new data, new and uh, newly collected and complex data will relate to the historical use of race and ethnic categories, and we look forward to working uh, with these agencies to address these issues. Uh, the question has come up, uh, uh, that I have uh, as I've heard it, of, of double counting people. Um, I, what, I, what it caused me to, to think about is that this um, uh, problem, quote unquote problem, has, has been raised in the past with respect to women. Um, and minorities, whether uh, you know black women are counted twice or Hispanic women are counted twice, and it ha simply hasn't been a problem. We, what we do is we disaggregate the data. If we have a sex discrimination case, then all women, black or white, uh, are regarded as women for those purposes. If we have a race discrimination case, um, you, you know, 
then all members of whatever the protected minority in question is are counted uh, for those purposes. Uh, in our litigation, I would presume that we would continue uh, uh, to, to handle the data in that fashion. Um, and, and uh, you know, to disaggregate it when necessary and not uh, when not. A lot of our cases um, are, especially in the area of employment discrimination, are, uh, are combined cases. They're not only are they race and sex, but they may be on behalf of a number of uh, racial minorities, and, and therefore th this would, you know, th this can only help, actually. Um, the, the questions raised by federal measures uh, of race and ethnicity are difficult and often emotional ones. Uh, and have been well addressed by the interagency committee, uh, and we commend them. The bottom line for law enforcement for the Civil Rights Division uh, is that we need complete, accurate, and reliable data in order to combat effectively the types of discrimination against racial and ethnic minorities that are prohibited by these vital laws passed by Congress. And we look forward to continuing to work uh, uh, to, on, on the question of how to interpret uh, the data that are collected. Um, and I, I look forward to any questions that you may have. Uh, we'll uh, proceed with the two other witnesses, and we'll have general questions. Uh, the next witness is Nancy Gordon, the Associate Director for Demographic Programs of the Bureau of the Census. Ms. Gordon. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to appear before you again today uh, to testify. I remember you did take the oath. I, mean. I did. <laughs> yes, I do remember. Tell the truth now. Yes. Okay. And I promise that I will tell the truth, and it is a pleasure to be here <laughs> again today. <laughs> um, uh, I think that what, I, what I think perhaps might be uh, most useful uh, in terms of, of the time available, uh, but I am seeking your advice here, is to just uh, make a, um, a brief opening remark or two and then go directly to the section at the end of my testimony uh, that deals with uh, the implications of the recommendations of the Interagency Committee yeah. for the Census Bureau's um, that, programs. That's fine if you'd like to proceed that way. Um, let me just observe then that if the OMB does make any changes to Directive Number 15, the Census Bureau intends to collect and produce data consistent with those changes. We believe that it is essential that there be such standards for use by all federal agencies to ensure that data are consistent and comparable. Um, the Census Bureau's role in this process has been primarily to conduct research uh, the second of the major tests we conducted was the race and ethnic targeted test. Uh, and um, some re uh, results from that work that relate especially to recommendations of the Interagency Committee uh, is um, summarized in my statement. Uh, but if we turn to the bottom of page 7, um, that starts uh, the section on impl implications of the recommendations um, for our programs. Um, and in particular for uh, the decennial census. We have reformatted the forms we currently plan to use in the Census 2000 dress rehearsal, which is planned for 1998, to determine the feasibility of accommodating the changes recommended by the Interagency Committee should they be adopted by the OMB. We have therefore placed the Hispanic origin question before the race question, used the instruction mark one or more races, and made the proposed changes in terminology. We were able to do so without any technical difficulties or lengthening of the form. We published a Federal Register notice about questions on race and ethnicity on July 17th, and public comments will be accepted during the following 60 days. We plan to capture multiple responses to the race question with the data capture hardware and imaging technology regardless of whether or not Directive Number 15 is modified. We also expect to be able to capture unrequested multiple responses to the Hispanic origin question. Uh, doing so was recommended by our Hispanic Advisory Committee uh, and uh, brought up earlier today uh, by Mr. Fernandez. Uh, and we plan to do that. Uh, in order to provide the information for uh, further analysis and research um, on the topic of uh, multi-ethnic responses. This uh, uh, imaging technology can read written characters as well as marked circles. While some technical issues remain about the exact coding of the write-in responses, 
and about the exact format of the permanent electronic census file. We intend to maximize the amount of information we retain. As in the past, Census 2000 will collect more detailed data on race than the minimum required by the Office of Management and Budget. And those data will be processed in such a way as to maintain maximum flexibility for data users. Census data, including those on race, will be available to users through the Census 2000 tabulation and publication series. Uh, all of which will follow whatever standards and guidelines the OMB ultimately issues. The data access and dissemination system will allow even more options and broader access for users to generate customized tabulations. Um, this system uh, will be available through the internet so that people can access either tabulations that have already been produced by the Census Bureau or they can create um, instructions and um, then automatically receive the tables that they're interested in. Selected microdata files will also be available, but the confidentiality of individual respondents will always be maintained. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to answer any questions. We will get to that shortly. Uh, we now have Dr. Waters, Professor of Sociology, Harvard University. Dr. Waters. Thank you for inviting me to uh, talk with the committee today. Um, I'm just going to summarize my, my written statement and talk a little bit about some of the issues that have been brought up in earlier testimony. Um, uh, I think that the interagency report synthesizes an em enormous amount of new research that the, the government has done in the last four years and that um, it will really be a while before we've been able to go through all of the research that they've come up with. But I was very impressed with the interagency report in the ways in which they really incorporated that, that new research um, into their uh, recommendations. Um, I have three reactions to the um, interagency report. Uh, the first has to do with tabulating results. And in my written statement, I went through uh, five different methods of tabulating results that were mentioned, even if briefly, in the um, interagency report. The first three um, were, were discussed by Harold McDougall earlier in his testimony. The first was the single race approach, where um, uh, everyone who checked more than one would go into a multiple uh, response category. The second was an all-inclusive approach in which we would uh, uh, sum up to more than 100 percent. The third was the historical series approach, which was, uh, was defined in detail in the rate report. Um, the fourth was the proposal for an algorithm that distributes responses from a multiracial category in proportion to the distributions of the current single race categories, and I think that was rightly dismissed uh, in, in one sentence in the, um, in the report. The fifth was um, the idea that there are algorithms currently which take people who either put themselves in another category or in some states into a multiracial category that that use certain characteristics of people to try and match them to the um, existing historical categories. Um, so that's another possibility. And then there were two others that I outlined in my written report that um, that we've we've actually used looking at ancestry data, which does come in in multiple categories. Um, one is to assign a weight to a person so that. Um, uh, and this is something statisticians and demographers do all the time, although it, it sounds kind of awful when you describe it as doing it to a person. You're, you're certainly not doing it to a person, you're doing it to a number. Uh, but what you would do is, is count somebody in both, say, the Asian and the white category, but you would give them a, a weight of 0.5, um, because then you would add all of your, um, your percentages in the end, and you'd come back out to 100%. You wouldn't have any more. Um, uh, people counted um, than you had people. And then the seventh would be to just randomly assign people um, in proportion. Uh, so if, if uh, you were half and half, um, half pe of the people who said that they were that combination would be put into one race and another. I'm sure there are other ways actually to, to tabulate. Um, uh, these are just some of the ones that were mentioned and a few that, that we've used before. Um, I think that the issue which was raised uh, by many people earlier this morning about the concern about double counting um, is, is something which uh, is, is definitely something for professional demographers and statisticians to worry about how you would actually do it, but it, it actually is common um, to, to, 
to have to do that for particular kinds of counts. And in a way, actually, you can think about the Hispanic and the race question as already doing that to some extent, because people are in the Hispanic question and they're in the, the race question. And so sometimes when you are looking at, um, say, incomes uh, for people, People may appear in the Hispanic category, and they may also appear in the white or the black category, depending on how savvy the researcher is who's actually uh, preparing those uh, reports. So I, I think we do have some um, experience with dealing with this overlap, but of course it really will be a new question as to how those tabulations um, are done. And of course there's a lot of political implications for what choice you make about how to do that. Um, let me just talk about two brief, briefly two other questions which came to my mind reading the interagency report. One is the issue of the um, implementation of how these data are actually gathered and the question about that was touched on briefly before about uh, different agencies that collect data by observer and by self-identification. And the question really being that I'm not sure we have enough research to tell whether or not observers might assign more races to people or less races to people than the people themselves would. And the question would be, if you allow more than one race, how will that affect data that is gathered by observers? And um, that happens, for instance, in school data. Often teachers will, will sum up how many kids of particular races there are. Um, the error rate, I'm sure, if somebody is guessing about multiple races, is going to be greater than if they're guessing about one race. Um, and so that, that's a question I think that we need some research um, on. Uh, secondly, uh, the instructions to respondents will be extremely important um, in how these, uh, these data are collected. And I think that um, uh, there, there should be some attention paid to how, uh, whether or not the word I identify is in there or not. Um, sort of whether people feel like they're being asked for their genealogy or sort of who they think they are. And sometimes that's been confused in, in earlier questions on earlier censuses, and so I think we need to pay attention to that. Um, the, the, the third reaction I had to the report, and it, it's really just been reinforced s sitting through um, everyone else's testimony today, is that um, Politically, uh, all of the attention has been on blacks uh, and whites. Uh, most of the attention has been on, on uh, African Americans and whites, and that's, that's very understandable given our political history. But all of the research that's summarized in this report points to the fact that it's American Indians and Asians who will be most impacted by this change because they have very high intermarriage rates, because they have a very high uh, population that could claim more than one ancestry, and because they are a small group so that um, uh, a, a few people changing can have a greater proportional impact. And the research actually finds that a lot of these changes won't have much effect at all on the overall counts of blacks and whites, but it will on American Indians and Asians. So I would stress that, that I would want to get reactions from the American Indian and Asian community um, to this issue because uh, I think they really are the ones who stand to, to have the most impact. Um, I think that um, the, the question that, that came up often today about the tabulation and how that um, will be handled really touches on the issue where there are competing principles um, at play here. And that is the issue of historical continuity with earlier data and self-identification. And that's kind of why the issue has come up in the first place is that people are trying to say we have more than one race and historically we haven't let that happen. So the question of how you bridge historical data to the current data that you're going to collect, which will allow people to have more than one race, um, is very important for this census. But I think also the, the thing I would also stress is to really think about the fact that you're also setting up for the censuses that will follow, so the 2010 census. Um, and one, one point that's very important to make is that if you make a small change now, that will provide perhaps the bridge to the society that will be in 2010, which may have even very different things that we can't even foresee. But putting off making the change would make a much greater disruption, I think, in the historical series. So. Um, there may be a real disjuncture between this issue of self-identification and historical um, continuity. Um, and it may play out, I think, in terms of this issue of responding categories and reporting categories. How you tabulate may be different than how you collect. Um, and that's a question that, that um, 
I'd like to see the OMB, you know, uh, describe the, the real, maybe even have a matrix in, if you answer these, these particular categories, where will you end up in what kind of tabulations? Well, thank you very much. Let me pose a basic question here. The whole reason for the census, very frankly, as we all know, and first one being done in 1790, is how you apportion the House of Representatives. So it truly does reflect even numbers of people, each representative. And what was 30,000 at one time is now 600,000. And because we've, by our own action, stopped the size of the House at 435 members. Now, let me give you an example of, let's say, this is a congressional district. And I'm particularly interested in the Justice Department because this is what people that draw up reapportionment lines have to think of. And to take California, uh, the last time the uh, majority in the legislature, their action was vetoed by the governor of an opposite party, and it was thrown into the Supreme Court of California. This is the 1990 census. And the Supreme Court said, well, we, we really don't know much about it. Let's appoint three retired judges representing both parties and have them go and examine the evidence, draw the lines. And I call the 1990 apportionment the only honest apportionment since California became a state in 1850 uh, because the three judges did a terrific job. But one question comes to mind. And that is the Voting Rights Act of 1965 as amended. I underline the as amended. The judges felt they could not diminish the voting strength of a minority population. And so they reached out to try to combine as much of that minority population as they could. In a sense, they diluted the strength of the minority population because whereas it was in two congressional districts, it became overly focused in one congressional district. And when you go at this situation of the historic racial discrimination in this country, I think the Supreme Court recognizes, General, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that obviously the black African-American race has had the most discrimination doesn't mean Mexican Americans aren't discriminated against, doesn't mean Asian Americans weren't discriminated against. They were in land in California. They never were in voting, to my knowledge. Mexican Americans in Texas, they were discriminated against. So there's different patterns for other minorities as to whether there's a historic discrimination that relate to certain areas of government policy. And so I'd be curious uh, what your thinking would be on, were the judges right to combine the minority population across several districts because they didn't want to dilute their voting power. Yet they would have had more voting results by being spread over two congressional districts or three congressional districts. How do you tackle that one? Well, um, as, as you rightly point out, the, the, this is a very, very complex question and, a, and, a, and a, a whole, there are a number of variables that, that anyone drawing districts has to consider. Um, the first being one person, one vote, uh, then the question of uh, uh, not That's diluting. That's the easy one. Right. <laughs> right. Then, you know, not diluting minority uh, voting strength or retrogression from, from previous strength, which is the Section 5 standard. Um, I have to tell you that I'm not familiar with the, enough, at all, if at all, with the California reapportionment, so I, I don't really feel that I can uh, comment on that um, with any degree of intelligence. Um, I, I do think apropos of, of, the, of the, what we're discussing here, which is the change in, in, in data collection, that this, how, the tab, how, the, how people will be tabulated for these purposes uh, is a very key question and is the question which uh, is still undergoing some analysis. So, um, you know, I know this comes across as a dodge, but uh, the truth of the matter is I don't know the answer. <laughs> well, it, you're absolutely correct. It's a very difficult value judgment call. And maybe you could go at it this way, saying, based on your experience as a civil rights lawyer, uh, what are the court's standards when different cases come before it? For example, uh, one basic question is, do women have the uh, same uh, imprimatur of the Constitution on their issues compared to African Americans? 
And I wish you'd give us a little summary there of how the court has, okay. over the years, adopted sort of a hierarchy uh, to worry about. Yeah. Um, well, the, the, the uh, Equal Protection, 14th Amendment Equal Protection analysis, um, at one time um, created basically two categories. Um, th those categories which were subject to so-called strict scrutiny test, uh, which included only, which was only race and national origin and religion on the one hand, and, uh, and all other kinds of categories or classifications that the legislature might do, which was absolutely everything else. In other words, on urban, rural, Income were all subject to the to the rational basis test, which is a, a fairly uh, a low test as compared to the strict scrutiny, which is a very very stiff test. Um, over the years, uh, starting in, in around 1970, uh, there was a so-called intermediate level was was developed by the courts, uh, which is referred to as heightened scrutiny or intermediate scrutiny, uh, and uh, to which uh, and that's the classification to which gender has uh, has been subjected, um, and it's sometimes viewed as being between the two, although with the most recent Supreme Court uh, decision on this matter, the VMI case, um, moved it closer to strict scrutiny. It's not all the way there. So the short answer is that uh, classifications or discrimination on the basis of gender does not have the same degree of scrutiny uh, by the courts as discrimination on the basis of race, national origin, and religion. Um, and, and that's... Uh, even though women, of course, didn't get the vote until 1920, uh, uh, the, they're not covered. Sex discrimination is not covered under the Voting Rights Act at all. Um, race discrimination, uh, national origin discrimination are. Um, on the other hand, um, just to sort of close the circle, gender is included um, in, for instance, in Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, employment discrimination, and uh, for those purposes, uh, with, with one exception that doesn't really apply to this discussion, it's the same standard for, for gender and race, um, if that was what you were looking for. Well, it's just, as I'm saying, the, the court has had different values right. to review in different periods. And there's a steady evolution, however, and you've sort of summed up where it is now. But when you have, let's say, a district of 14% white, 40% black, 35% Hispanic, 10% Asian, 1% American Indian. That is not a myth. That is, are, those are real districts in the state mm -hmm. of California. And then I would try to say, what does the tabulation from the various racial checkoffs mean when judges, in this case retired judges, if we go that route again, or legislatures uh, have to look at it and say, well, gee, which group in there seems to be the most discriminated against? Well, historically, you'd have to say the black voter was, or non-voter, because they wouldn't let them register, was the most discriminated against. But as I said, in Texas, Mexican Americans were discriminated against in Texas. That was not true in California. Some would, might say it is, but the facts are uh, you didn't have a problem registering. And uh, American Indians, for various other reasons, uh, have probably a low registration turnout because of moving from reservation to urban America and back and so forth. But that's what they're going to have to deal with. And uh, I just wonder if one would like to speculate on what adding those checkoffs that is now being recommended by the interagency committee will either enlighten us and be able to make better reapportionment decisions or simply confuse us. Well, I th as I said in my testimony, I think on balance that it's a step in the right direction. Uh, the fact is that this, our society is more complex than it was previously, and, and that, that's a reality that, that the, the courts and Congress simply have to deal with. Um, I, I also should say that, as I said, we, the, the question of precisely that question of the tabulation, the, 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 the use and interpretation uh, that this data will be subjected to for purposes of redistricting uh, is not something that there is a, s a specific recommendation on at this point. Um, as an attorney, uh, I always depend on demographers and statisticians, frankly, uh, to tell me, <laughs> uh, you know, what the best approach is. I am not an expert in that respect. Well, let me put um, another so factor in here. Uh, after 13 years on the Civil Rights Commission and being on the drafting team for the Voting Rights Act of 65 and Civil Rights Act of 64, the fact is there's one basic factor that nobody ever faces up to, and that's socioeconomic class and income. 
and they used to just look at me with glazed over eyes when I'd raise the obvious, that what you have to do, you're not dealing with Ralph Bunch. Uh, you're dealing with the person that's poor. And where do we and how do we relate those data to a lot of government programs are relevant to it. But when we get to voting data, perhaps also economic class yeah. should be taken in to see if there is an under or over representation in a particular area and right. how are these people registered. Well, Mr. Chairman, there's clearly, a, uh, obviously, an interaction of, of those factors and, uh, and, and socioeconomic status is very important. It's also true that Ralph Bunch could be subjected to discrimination on the basis of race. The, um, uh, Deval Patrick, the former assistant attorney general, uh, you know, was, had taxi cabs passing by outside the White House. And uh, so it's, you know, they can't, we can't ignore uh, race in these discussions uh, when we're discussing discrimination. I, I don't uh, want to ignore you, it. I want you, you it to get it into realism. Right. Though. And, well, again, as I say, uh, my eyes don't glaze over when you talk about socioeconomic uh, data because I do, in fact, believe that that's a very important factor. And, and one of the things that, the, that these data allow you to do, by the way, is to see what the overlap is, to see to what degree um, race and, and, and poverty, frankly, right. uh, correlate. Uh, they're, you know, the, and that's an important piece of information to have. It's true with educational data as well. I mean, just across the across the uh, spectrum, it's very important, and we and, and for various we would use that kind of data for various purposes in a regression analysis, for instance. Um, so, so I, do, I don't at all. Um, you know, I agree with you, basically. Um, also, as I mentioned when I was talking about equal protection analysis, of course, the Supreme Court uh, has steadfastly refused to take into account. Uh, uh, socioeconomic data and, and give it any form of heightened scrutiny, and that's the way the law is right now. Dr. Waters, you want to comment on any of this discussion? Well, I think that, that one advantage of this uh, way of collecting data is that for the first time we'll actually have um, information on, say, whether people who are uh, black and white or, or Asian and white um, look similar to people who are black or people who are white or um, uh, or have their own characteristics. So one of the questions earlier was uh, should should people who are, are part one race and part another be subject to uh, equal protection? Should they be subject to dis uh, anti-discrimination laws specifically for them? Um, one of the problems up until now is that we haven't had the data to answer the question as to whether or not their incomes are higher or lower, whether their infant mortality rate is higher or lower. This, um, this proposal would actually allow you to begin to, to describe the demographic characteristics of, of those people. And so it might actually uh, reassure us that some things are better than we thought, or it might point us to some problems that we hadn't thought about before. Anybody else like to question the administration, witnesses at all who are <coughs> from some of the advocacy groups? Let's see what your concerns are and their answers, and vice versa. Uh, yeah, it's really more in, in the way of a comment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. McDougall, NAACP. Um, I uh, want to thank uh, Ms. Pinsler for her example of the um, cases in which women uh, and minorities are discriminated against because for me that just kind of crystallizes the whole issue and uh, Mr. Conyers earlier today said it wasn't rocket science and I was thinking to myself, au contraire, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> but uh, I think she just, she just really broke it right down. Um, I think that the the, the difficulty that everybody's having, and I think particularly the representatives who are concerned about apportionment, frankly, is that the data, the collection of, uh, I think I said in my testimony that the, um, the interagency group had kind of cut the Gordian knot by moving the issue down the pipeline. In other words, we are now no longer concerned, or at least hopefully we won't, if some of these little nuances get fixed, we won't be concerned with the way the data is collected. And the data is going to be collected in a way that seems to meet everybody's concerns. The issue now is how do you how do you put Humpty Dumpty back together again? I mean, does he have an arm? Does he have, you know do all of those pieces? And is he is he now twins? Um, as long as we understand that the data is going to be used for different purposes, I think we can we can we can kind of come away from this hearing with 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 fairly clear heads. Um, one of the Principal purposes, of course, is the census data is capitation or headcount. 
there's nothing inconsistent with collecting data this way and having an exact tabulation of the number of people that there are who live in a certain area uh, in the United States generally or a certain um, uh, um, congressional district. You can then use the data as it has been collected to demonstrate that there are uh, a certain number of, uh, of women uh, in, the, uh, in the populations in, in a certain metropolitan uh, economic market area. Um, and you can determine that they are overrepresented or underrepresented in terms of certain levels of employment. Same thing with race, as you know, uh, Ms. Pinsler you know, so, well, uh, so aptly pointed out. They have never had problems like this. This data has never created a problem. You can disaggregate the data to show all the women there are. You can disaggregate the women to show all the members of minority groups there are. And now the way that the data is being collected, we'll be able to show all the people who are of one race or who are partially of that race. And, and having that information might very well be useful. Uh, so I just want to emphasize that the double counting problem in some ways is a red herring. Uh, you know, I think that the Census Bureau has already demonstrated that they're able to, um, to handle that. Um, we also, I think as I mentioned earlier, we continue to be concerned about, ish, about instances in which um, uh, people are identified by the basis of, of, of observers rather than through interview. Because once you're identified by an observer, we kind of fall back into some of the problems that we've had before. Uh, and I think we've heard already that those instances are situations where you're talking about a death certificate or you're talking about an um, uh, admission into the emergency room of a hospital, let's say. And that there, are, there might be other circumstances, and obviously we'd be very concerned about which ones those would be. Finally, just to kind of emphasize the, the, the piece about uh, wanting to be able to track all instances of discrimination, which is the NAACP's primary concern. And I, I think, again, Ms. Pinsler has given us, I think, the light that shines through that. I was going to say, I thought about this over lunch. You know, think about a, a guy, we'll call him Joe Walker, okay, who's part Native American, he's part black, and he's part Asian. He lives on a reservation, or he, he has family on the reservation. He has enough contact with the reservation so that he gets a certain allotment from the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And, you know, we need census data to, to make that allotment. He goes off the reservation and he, um, he uh, looks for a job. Uh, and he's discriminated against uh, looking for the job because he's black, he's part black. We want to know that. He's also, let's say that his, he's part Asian because his grandfather was Japanese who was interned in, a, in an internment camp in California oh, during World War II. And, he was, and his grandfather was one of the people who was determined uh, was owed reparations under the Korematsu decision. We'd want to know, we want to make sure that he got what was coming to him. So the way that this data has been collected enables us to perform all three of those operations. And the notion that Joe Walker becomes three people instead of just one, I think Ms. Pinsler and the people from the OMB have demonstrated to us is a statistical absurdity that we don't have to get into. So I, I uh, stuck around here today because I wanted to hear what the rest of the folks had to say, and I can, must say I've been enlightened by their testimony. Thank you. Ms. Graham, you have a comment. I agree with, with what Mr. McDougall said. Pull the microphone said. close to you. It's hard to hear with that system. I agree with what Mr. McDougall said on, on tracking all instances of discrimination, and I think that's very important. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a statistician, and I'm really trying to understand this. Uh, maybe some people on the panel here can, can help me out. Um, and I'll give you an, an, a real life, real life instance. Um, you've met my son, Ryan. He's been here. He's testified. He's testified twice before Congress. When he was in kindergarten, his kindergarten teacher decided at the end of the school year that he should not be passed to first grade. She also decided not to pass to first grade one other child in the class, whose last name was Rodriguez, who had a black Hispanic father and a white mother. They were the only two multiracial children in the class. Uh, we went to the principal. We proved that uh, you know, Ryan was indeed able to be passed. Uh, he's now an honor student in, in middle school, so I think it worked out well for us. Uh, the Rodriguez child uh, was put back into kindergarten again. Now. These children are both multiracial. It's important, and I'm sure that Mr. McDougall will, will agree, 
to track black children, minority children in the schools to see who are placed into the, the remedial classes, uh, who are put into the advanced classes. We do track those by race for a reason. In this instance, if I said, well, you know, my child was discriminated against because two multiracial children were, were going to be held back out of the entire rest of the population of the class, I'm, well, from what I'm hearing, what I would get back is, no, one of them is black and white, and one of them is black and Hispanic, so they're not the same. Um, this is not going to be acceptable to our part of, of discrimination problems. And I'm wondering how this would be worked out under the, the uh, interagency recommendation. May I? Please. Um, we should probably talk later, but um, can may I ask you, were, were there any, were there black and white children uh, in those classes, or were, were all the rest white? Predominantly white. Predominantly. Uh, it, it is possible, uh, and, and you can't really draw from a sample of two uh, and, and make any kind of a statistical analysis, but if that were writ large, you might be, begin to see a pattern of discrimination against uh, children who, who were mixed race, the, 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 you know, the, the animus being about mm -hmm. that. Uh, there is nothing in this formulation that, that would keep us from making that analysis. In fact, it would be very helpful in making that analysis. Um, there's so you can look at all the children who are of a mixed race as absolutely. a whole then? You, well, or yes, sure. Okay. You, could, you could take all the various okay. categories and do that if that's what you, you know, thought was happening, uh, if you had a large enough s sample to, to believe that that was what was happening. This would present no problem with respect to that. I, I, I might also say that, that as I, I say, there are then. race and sex discrimination. As I said before, there are race and sex discrimination cases, and 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 every once in a while, you will have you know somebody being required to you know to pick what, was it race or sex discrimination that happened to you, and, and sometimes you don't know, and so, uh, you know until you get into the process. And again, we can can look at those kinds of cases, mm -hmm. and, and analyze it, and, and it may be both. There you know it may be a combination. So uh, th th I'm not troubled from a perspective of making discrimination cases um, by the fact that it would be reported in a more uh, varied way, that you would have more information rather than but less that's information. Why, that's why to us, seeing how this is going to be reported and tabulated is important. Well, yes, and I, we, we all agree with that. Let me uh, ask this question for the record and see what your response is to it. Uh, General, the written testimony seems to mention a variety of areas in which data on race are used to enforce civil rights laws. Mm -hmm. Often you need to know the size of the minority population in an area, as we both noted, a labor pool, a housing market, for instance, in order to see if the population is underrepresented and possibly facing discrimination. Now, how would you count a minority population for these purposes under the Interagency Committee recommendation? Would multiracials who check black as one of their races be counted as black? If this were the case, how would you avoid overcounting when you consider more than one minority group in the same area? Wouldn't firms find themselves vulnerable to charges of low minority representation, even if they employ the right, quote, percentage, unquote, for their labor pool, because many in that labor pool will be counted twice or more, isn't that true? Yeah, no, I, I actually, I, I don't think so. I think that, uh, I was actually, um, heartened by what uh, Ms. Katzen had to say about that, 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 it, um, that you could disaggregate the data so you wouldn't have, you wouldn't be counting people more than once. You would, might have more and varied categories, but you wouldn't be counting people more than once, so you would know how many people who, you know, of the various, you know, you know black and Asian or black and white, um, and those might all be counted as minorities. It really it depends on what the local labor market looks like, what the employers uh, uh, labor pool looks like as to whether, uh, you know, that even becomes a factor statistically, frankly. Well, I can recall a state official in California coming to my campus and we just, he was so off the wall on his understanding on the Civil Rights Act and since I'd had something to do with it, I knew it and I just kept quiet and we just simply had everybody write a memo when he drifted around the university. And what he said to one of our people was, I'm not interested in the discrimination against blacks. I'm not interested in the discrimination against American Indians. I'm here strictly to help women or to help Hispanics. 
Now, you know, this is a civil rights enforcement officer. Could not the firm <laughs> simply play games, yeah. though, with this system where if, you've, if you're taking all the mixtures here and they say, okay, they want to see Hispanics, great. Run that tabulation through the mm -hmm. pool where we've got people that are Hispanic. Mm -hmm. Give them that one and see if that keeps them quiet. Mm -hmm. Or you could say, run the black data census through the pool. And, uh, you know, well, how, isn't that subject to manipulation? Well, again, as I say, if it's subject, it, 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 it no, <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, and if it's, if it's properly tabulated, and, 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 and I'm sorry that somebody, you know, a civil rights enforcer had, had that kind of view. It's, an, I think, a very unusual view among civil rights enforcers. That's what said, his supervisor right. told him after we got fully fed right. up with I, it. I, bet said, so. I imagine so. He said my interpretation yeah. of the law was correct. Yeah, and, and my, 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 by, by the way, my experience of various, you know, groups, you know, organizations that may, you know, represent specific groups is that, you know, that, that they interact on that. Um, having done, I, I spent most of my career prior to uh, coming to the government doing, uh, doing women's rights cases, uh, sex discrimination cases. We always know, you know, w if we looked into a situation and saw that there was, you know, there might be data uh, indicating race discrimination, we always uh, took notice of that. Um, I, I really don't know how else to answer your question, we, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm put in mind of, uh, you know, the, the famous quote from Sojourner Truth, ain't I a woman? Um, it's, you know, just, you know, a, a, a black woman may be discriminated against because she's a woman or she may be discriminated against because she's black. Um, and, and, and any kind of sophisticated uh, look at this will, will want to, you know, at, at these situations will want to have as much information as possible. Um, that's you know, the best answer I can give you to that question. Well, we, they're always, I suppose, subject possible to, you know, to possible abuses with these things, but we would hope that that would be at a minimum. Dr. Waters. I think whenever you're, you're dealing with multiple responses on a, any one question, you do have to be extremely careful about how you calculate the denominator and how you calculate the numerator. And there, there is, a, I, I would say that there is a danger if you have different agencies using different methods of tabulating the denominators and numerators, and if you don't have some standardization from OMB, and maybe you need three sets of standardization for three different kinds of purposes, one for apportionment, one for discrimination, and one for something else, but you are going to, you can get very confused, and in fact, you can even see it sometimes if you look at reports that compare Hispanics, that include Hispanics with, with racial categories in terms of reporting things. Sometimes people themselves, analysts, are confused as to whether or not somebody's in both categories or not. So, so I think you're right to be worried that there is a potential for confusion there, but the potential is, is different, I think, than, than saying you can't do it. And I think it really does rest on um, OMB or someone having uh, some, some rules about and it may be that you have to have different sets of rules for different purposes, but you do need some rules so that agencies can talk to one another, especially since denominators often come from the Census Bureau, numerators come from national health statistics. If one is double, double counting and one is using weights or something like that, you could, it could be a statistical nightmare. So I, I, I do think that you have to pay attention to it. That's not to say that you can't do it at all. Now, we don't have anybody here representing, the, say, the Centers for Disease Control, but to what degree have they been involved in approving of this interagency report? Uh, Ms. Wallman might uh, know. I think it would be important to get that on the record, since uh, some diseases are ethnic race related, and uh, it would be uh, helpful, I think, in health data to know that. Perhaps this is one way to go as a result. Ms. Yes. Wallman, it, why don't you identify yourself for the record? Thank you. I'm Catherine Wallman from the Office of Management and Budget. Chief and I, Statistician I was sworn of in. the United States. <laughs> that has you, a nice ring to it. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, I, I would like to confirm that uh, multiple parts of the Department of Health and Human Services were involved in this 30 agency task force, including the National Center for Health Statistics, which is part of the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, there was actually another representative directly from CDC. 
uh, as well there were other folks from the department overall. So uh, the health agencies indeed were uh, quite well covered in this uh, initiative and were part of the 30 agency group that's been referred to. So they're very supportive of this recommendation. I, indeed they are. Okay. Now any other questions any of you'd like to ask? Uh, I have two things left to do then. I'm going to read into the record the speaker's uh, remarks. He's still in negotiations with the Senate and we're trying to clear a few things out of here to prove we did cut taxes, we did cut spending, and we did save Medicare. So let me just read his statement and then I want to thank the staff that's been involved with this hearing and I thank all of you as witnesses. It's, uh, I'm sorry we had to go through all these votes on the uh, House floor but uh, you've been very patient and we appreciate getting your thoughts in the record. Uh, the speaker's comments are these. Uh, Mr. Chairman, America is a nation of immigrants. We have in America people who have, for various reasons, come to America for a better opportunity. Before there was a nation called the United States, pilgrims fleeing religious persecution landed in a place they called the New World. In the 1800s, the Irish came to these shores, fleeing a famine which had devastated their country. As recently as the 1970s, Vietnamese fled a homeland wounded by decades of war. These and so many others saw hope and opportunity in America. They came here for a chance to succeed. They made the conscious decision to become a part of a new family, to become Americans. And becoming an American is a unique experience which comes with certain responsibilities, certain habits that one has to absorb and accept to successfully finish the process. An American is not French the way the French are or German the way the Germans are. You can live in either of these countries for years and never become French or German. I think one of the reasons Tiger Woods has had such a big impact is because he is an American. He defines himself as an American. As Tiger described himself, quote, I just am who I am, whatever you see in front of you, unquote. I think we need to be prepared to say, said the speaker, the truth is we want all Americans to be quite simply Americans. That doesn't deprive anyone of the right to further define their heritage. I go to celebrations such as the Greek festival in my district every year. It doesn't deprive us of the right to have ethnic pride, to have some sense of our origins. But it is wrong for some Americans to begin creating subgroups to which they have higher loyalty than to America at large. The genius of America has always been its ability to draw people from everywhere and to give all of them an opportunity to pursue happiness in a way that no other society has been able to manage. Andrea Brown, writing in the Chicago Tribune on April 18, 1997, wrote about Tiger Woods, quote, We might be saved by the amazing grace of golf and by a kid with a swing whose mixed heritage could be a recipe for hope proving to the world that it's not what color you are, but the way you carry yourself, the way you persist to reach your dreams. When he steps to the tee, Tiger Woods does not represent the struggle of African Americans. When he sinks a putt, the athletic future of Chinese Americans does not rest on his shoulders. Rather, what Tiger Woods does embody each time he walks a golf course is the potential of youth and the reward of diligence. What Tiger Woods typifies is the best of what we all can be, unquote. America, says the speaker, is too big and too diverse to categorize each and every one of us into four rigid racial categories. The administration has made a decision to force us to choose artificial categories that do not accurately reflect the racial identity of America. Millions of Americans like Tiger Woods or my constituent, Ryan Graham, who testified before you earlier this year have moved beyond the Census Bureau's divisive and inaccurate labels. We live in a technicolor world where the government continues to view us as only black and white. It is time for the government to stop perpetuating racial divisiveness. It is time to treat individuals as individuals and to adopt the attitude about our fellow Americans that Lou Ann Mullen, a Native American Texan, who fought valiantly to be allowed to adopt two black children, expressed about her own family when asked about their multiracial makeup. Said Ms. Mullen, we are often described that way, but I don't think of us that way. To me, we are just my family. Said the speaker, that should be our goal for the way we as Americans feel about one another. That is why ideally, 
I believe we should have one box on federal forms that simply reads American. But if that is not possible at this point, we should at least stop forcing Americans into inaccurate categories aimed at building divisive subgroups and allow them the option of selecting the category multiracial, which I believe will be an important step toward transcending racial division and reflecting the melting pot, which is America. Now, I'd like to thank the following people that have uh, prepared this hearing. Uh, our staff director for the Subcommittee on Management is Russell George. Uh, the one directly responsible for most of this hearing is John Hines, professional staff member on your left and my, or your right and my left. Uh, Andrea Miller, our clerk, and uh, her staff of uh, uh, interns, uh, David McMillan for the minority, professional staff member Jean Gosa, clerk for the minority. Uh, the interns are Darren Carlson, Jeff Cobb, John Kim, Grant Newman. And uh, our court reporter is Barbara Smith. Thank you very much. With that, this hearing is adjourned. Later on our companion network, C-SPAN 2, live coverage of a hearing on last year's bombing at the Atlanta Olympics. One of the witnesses you'll hear from is FBI Director Louis Free. That's live today at 9.30 a.m. Eastern on our companion network, C-SPAN 2. Justice William Brennan served on the Supreme Court for 33 years. He was appointed to the High Court by President